Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Illum series on Houdini 17 and my top 10 features. And the whole purpose between this webinar is to take a look at the other parts of Houdini 17 that may or may not have been in the limelight. And um, I'm going to keep this pretty cheap, and, uh, you know, cheap and cheerful as we always do with Chris, answering a lot of your questions as they come up. And I think the real purpose here is to get everybody familiar with a lot of the little tiny things that was that, that ended up inside of Houdini 17 that, that may have snuck under the radar. And as you all know, um, I love a lot of the procedural aspects of Houdini. So uh, we're going to take a look at a bunch of the new SOPs that we've added and why they were added, and take a look at at least one example of every SOP that we that we put into this into the into Houdini 17. And um, I think the best place to start off with is with the documentation itself. And for that, we're gonna fire up Houdini 17. And I'm using today's build, 170380, and I'm on Windows on my laptop, it's a Lenovo, with a fairly decent graphics card, a decent amount of memory. So, oh, we got a hand raised as well. So let's make sure that everybody's up and running. And in the meantime, I'm going to fire up the documentation on my laptop. So, and the, probably the best way to start off with is to open up a help pane. So let's uh, let's create a new pane tab. Uh, select pane tab type, and let's put in a nice help browser in there because we're going to be using this as we navigate through Houdini. And as you all know, um, the I do like the technical desktop. So if you wish to follow along, um, please do so. And if some want me to use the technical desktop while they use build, I can swap these two around here as well. Um, but let's take a look at the help. And even before we take a look at the help, whenever I fire up a new version of Houdini, um, one that's freshly released, believe it or not, <laughs> the first place I go to is the preferences. So let's have a look at the preferences. Um, it's always a great idea to see what have they tweaked there. So I'm gonna fire up on general user interface. And we'll notice that in here, we have the probably, possibly the most important thing for visual effects users and for effects TDs is the play bar UI size. As you'll know, the play bar is a lot larger now. It's a lot wider than it was in Houdini 16.5. And if you really want to get a, a compact version of the play bar, <laughs> this could be possibly the top, top one of the top 10 for you. You can actually choose compact. And what that does is it will remove a lot of the external decorations and literally gives you a play bar that's perfect suited for doing effects work. For instance, there's much of the keyframe options are, are hidden, as well as some of the transport tools are, are hidden, and it just gives you a much more streamlined view. I'm gonna run in the normal mode because we definitely wanna take a look at some of the new features that are available to us in the play bar, and hopefully make a pitch for maybe keeping it larger if you, if you are so inclined. Um, some other things that we've changed uh, as well in here is uh, um, if we go take a look at animation, for example, we've added some really nice options in the animation editor and motion effects view uh, that are pertaining to the new, that co -align, that align nicely with the new features that we add in the animation editor as well, underlined in the parameter editor. So we can turn these on, open animation editor if it's closed, clip, clip channels. But the one thing that's really nice here is underlined in the parameter editor. This is off by default, as well as use channel color. Turn these on. And let's have a look as we work in the interface to see how the parameters actually take on the color of the graph editor. So um, definitely um, really cool to keep on. So just wanna make sure that we're going trouble free so far. Excellent, thumbs up. So we can actually have some other options here, add parameters with animation, add parameters from descendants. This is all about uh, working with animation in the motion effects viewer, which is essentially chops as, as, as we know it. And view over the parameters in the motion effect view, if we wish to see those as well, we can turn them on here. Um, there's also some other options that are held over. So that's pretty much it for now. Please have a look at all the other options that are available to, to you. But essentially, those are the two that I wish you to turn on. So underlying as well as going back to general university. I definitely know about the play bar UI. So oh, now let's take a look at the actual help itself. Um, really well done by, by Matt and Debbie and our documentation team. And also, of course, R&D uh, coalescing a lot of the help 
that that's that uh, or a lot of the the help ideas that went into the documentation. So definitely press what's new in Houdini 17. And we can see here we have all the various highlights. As we know, there's a seems like there's a new vellum test on on Vimeo and YouTube every hour. And for me, as we'll take a look, vellum really is um, that long lost spring sop. And if you don't know what the spring sop was, it was a cheap and cheerful deformer. And we got it back in spades with the vellum solver. And the white water solver is all brand new and it actually has a couple tools in it that we're gonna be taking a look at. Uh, Material-based destruction, I'm not really gonna be covering that other than taking a look at the, the convex decomposition in the SOPs. And terrain, I can't do better than Ari Dinesh. He's already got two master classes out there now, one on using the new terrain erosion and the second one doing on hierarchical scattering. Absolute mandatory watching if you're interested in terrains. Now the UV tools. I will be diving into those. I think that there's a lot to be discovered there. So we're going to be taking a look at some of the SOPs that comprise the new UV tool set. And also the retime. For me, the retime SOP is huge. Um, so basically, the, 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 getting back to just the documentation itself, this is a great way to take a tour of Houdini 17 if you have, a time, if you have time pressing on these various different uh, links to have a look at, at what's there. Um, but I want to take a look now at some of the basic UI features that we have inside of Houdini. So I'm just going to go to my cheat sheet, which is actually folders. And uh, so, and sometimes my windows acts up a bit, but um, so we took a look at a bit of the documentation. Please have a look at it, peer into how far you can go. Um, and there's some examples as we're, as we're going to be taking a look at uh, going in there. Um, but we're going to take a look at the presets and updates, which we did, and now on to the UI. So some of the really cool features that we have inside of the UI are some of the parameter features. These are just blank folders, by the way, just telling me what things I need to, to take a look at. So why don't we just actually add a character? So we're going to go to the characters, and I think a simple female is a, is, is a good uh, example of just playing around with what we have in terms of animation updates. Now. With the preset set, remember I said about that preset about underlying parameters based on color, we can now see that the translate, the rotates, and the scales are now colored based on red for translate, green for rotate, and blue for scales. You'll also notice that if you're old school like me, scope is now pretty much erased from the interface as an idea, uh, replaced with a much more general way of of grabbing your animation and working with it. And right off the bat, I definitely want to show you this. Um, I mean, this really Houdini 17, to be honest, has been in, in development for close to a year and a half. And some of the features that we put inside of 16.5 when Kristen Bargill, head of R&D, decided, you know, let's see if we can ship a 16.5 and take a look at what features we could ship that would not break backward compatibility. As we know, these 0.5 releases are designed not to break backwards compatibility inside of production. So there's a lot of stuff we couldn't put in. And <laughs> a lot of the stuff you forget. So I try to rekindle all of that and, and definitely get into this. But let's actually put down a box. So tab box. And um, inside this box object, um, we can now move this. We can move it up. So lots of, lots of incremental changes with the handles we're going to be looking at as we go forward. And I'm going to press the K key with the box selected. So, and then to that, you actually get your keyframes. And on the play bar, we get some keyframes. And let's go back to, to another frame, move the box up, rotate it, and hit the K key. And now we've got some more keyframes. Again, just keep on moving on. Here using the M key, as we know, aligns our, aligns our handle to the world. And we can do the rotate key. Um, and you'll notice that uh, as I hit the K key, we now got a, got a few keyframes in the, in the play bar. But moving forward, why am I keying the scales? So what we can do here is I don't want to key the scales. So you can right mouse on the scales and you can basically see, first of all, delete the channels. So we've now stripped out all the keyframe animation on scales. I can also right mouse on this now and I can actually go to channels. And in here, I can, I can, um, I can basically remove from the channel list. And as soon as I do that, now when I select the box and I select this box and let's move them, hit the rotates, 
and I hit the K key, I'm no longer keying the scales. So now we've inherited this notion that's available in other applications where it's per node, by the way. So that means if I add a new box object and I choose to keyframe this new box object, you can see I'm keying all the scales. Um, so again, if I didn't want to key those scales, right mouse under channels, uh, basically remove from the channel list, which means it's no longer going to be keyframed. But it is safe per node type. So if I alt drag a copy of this box and I'm selecting box two and I want to move box two over to here, and now I press the K key gain, um, I do the scale. So let me right mouse on here <laughs> under, under actions and parameters and channels of oh, me here. So you do have to remove the channels removed from the channel list. Oh, or pardon me, in here it says, uh, I'm sorry, what I wanted to get here is under channels, it's delete in channel, it's de deselect in channel list, and also turn off auto select. So auto select is the option that now says, no matter what, it's never gonna be selected anymore. So now if I delete these channels. Now when I go to key this specific box, go over to here, I hit the K key, it no longer will, will key the scales. And now let's see if I can alt drag the box here to box three. And in this box, I'm gonna hit the, I'm gonna just move it over to here and press the K key. And you can see I'm no longer, oh, I'm still keying the scale. So maybe I do have to do that per object, but under channels, um, turn off auto select, delete the channels. So we have a way of muting the keys. As well, at any point in time, I can select the first box and in the lower left hand, or lower right hand side of the play bar, we have all of the animation controls now centralized. And we moved a lot of the preferences out of the preferences and onto the, onto the play bar so that you can now easily get into a stage where you might be doing some blocking or you might actually want to get into some, some finessing of your channels and do some final posing. Um, you now have all the channels available to you here. And this channel list, we can now add filters as well. So we can filter just on translates, on rotates, or on scales. And we can actually remove the scales. If we just want to keyframe just to translate the rotates on the various objects that we pick, we can do that. We can also type in filters in here, such as T, and um, turn these two off here, or um, basically turn them all on. And now we can filter just on T star. And now we're only going to be keying any parameters that have T star in, in their name as translates. So, and we have lots of helpful hints in the arrow button where we can choose some of the various different options, including this syntax here is, uh, as you'll see, there's this caret or this, this upward hat star dot X, Y, Z. And what this means is select everything, but all channels that are in square bracket, which means coalesce everything that either ends with X, Y, or Z. So we have some really nice uh, syntax in here as well, where you can just backspace, and then you can just simply choose your filters as you go. So everything nice and organized inside of the channel list. Another thing is we actually have some buttons here where you know we, the animator can quickly, this used to be buried in the preferences, now they're exposed. As well, we have another option here. If we right mouse on this node, you can see auto update channel list, keep channel list selections or clear channel list. So a lot of the various options that animators need as they're working through their animation, whether you're doing blocking or whether you're doing uh, some, some, some actual final, po some final work on your animation, you can do it in here. Plus, most importantly, we now have a nice way of popping up the channel editor. And there's some, and you'll notice that the, the long list of smarties and just this icon overload in the animation editor is now cleaned up with these nice menu options now. So definitely have a poke and look at all the various hotkeys that are available to you in the animation editor. And as if, if, it's, if you don't know this, we are working quite hard on the animation workflow inside of Houdini. So um, if you have any ideas about cleaning up or improving any of these, any of these uh, aspects that do with animation, we're all ears and listening to that as well. Quick question. Yep. Does that filtering work in all of the windows in the search? Um, no, it works specifically when you're doing your keyframing in the keyframing environment. Um, as you know, in the last release, we added the ability to, to literally filter, um, to filter the various different parameters on the node himself. You know, we have the parameter filters as well, and you can you can redo all the parameters. That way. You can actually hide these parameters now, on even on factory nodes. This is more to do with just simple anim with with animation. But what's really nice about this is I can take these two boxes now and let's. Uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna remove all this, I'm gonna delete all this animations that control shift left mouse button is how I delete stuff. And I've now deleted all the animation on box one and box two. I'm gonna blow away box. Now, 
this is also very, very powerful now. Prior to Houdini 17, we didn't have any way to basically take all the animation on one object and put it onto another object. So what we've added in Houdini 17 is if you right mouse button on the folder tabs themselves now, you have the exact same controls that you have on the parameters themselves. So you can, oh, by the way, I should have my camera off, right? Did I turn my camera off? Because people may stop video. Okay, because then you, and you can see, um, let me go full screen that way. So um, you can now right mouse on the folder tab and check this out under, uh, I can say copy the parameter. And when you do this in the folder, it grabs everything related to that to that folder and then I can go to the second box and I can say paste relative references so I can now have a set driven key relationship or I can right mouse on the second box and just say uh, paste expressions and channels so now we finally have a way of copying all of the motion from from all the animation from one object to the next and that goes for all folders so now let's go back to the simple female. And um, in the simple female, we can select her. And again, as we see here, um, always use the pose tool when you're dealing with characters. Um, pose tool has seen a couple nice enhancements as well. And with the pose tool, as we know, you can use the shift key and you can select multiple, multiple objects. By the way, what, you're, what you were just showing a minute ago, everyone's like, yeah, thumbs up. Oh yeah, 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 of course, yeah. This is what this is all about, guys. Um, that's fantastic. Um, shout out to the animation team. Um, I think they're six strong and growing, and uh, it includes all of the muscle work. We're, we're getting excited for the next release to really give you guys a strong, a strong set of tools to move even further in that direction. So we're, 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 you know, we're humbled by, by, by your interest in character. I know a lot of you are FX users, either in the games or the film side. So. Please humor us on the character side where there's a method to our madness. So, and, and, and there's going to be really good things coming up, you know, starting with the character effects side and pushing forward. So consider this to be a really, really good work in progress. Um, and I'd say a lot of these tools are good to go. But you'll notice right away when I'm in the pose tool, um, we can use the shift key. But what we did is we've added this thing here um, very, very sneakily on the left-hand side. There's a part of the movement in the UI to go to this secure selection mode. And if you're users of other software, um, you know, I'm very familiar with a few, few software packages, including SketchUp, and all of them, and most all of them, will make you go into either select mode or into a translate mode, like a move tool or an extrude tool. And it's very modal. So what we've added in the interface is the ability to do secure selection on and off. And I've seemed to have lost my, there should be a little icon up here in the viewport showing when secure selection is on or off. But if you are in a tool, let's say in the pose tool, secure selection on is what you want. Because no matter what I select, I'm going to be in the pose tool. But check this out, if I turn secure selection off, now if I accidentally select an object and hit the T key, I'm gonna move off the pose tool. So by going back to the post tool, turning secure selection on now, I can now use the T or and it still goes to the, or the Y handle will still go to the post tool. But at least now I am in the post tool no matter what it is that I do. So secure selection is now on when that button is there. And it's also available to you in SOPS. We'll see this secure selection show up when we're in SOPS. And as I said, the post tool allows you to, to do all of this. And again, um, now, what about this right mouse copy and paste parameters as well? So it works by, by name, by, by the actual name of the parameter. So if we say copy parameter here on the left arm, um, we can actually go to the right arm and we do paste uh, relative, let's say paste relative references in this case. It doesn't make much sense, but let's try it out. Now, what happens is we go by index. So the channel referencing internally is done by index. So for instance, this is channel set number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So when I paste it in the right arm, I'm literally getting one, two, three matchups. So it's actually matching up by the index of the parameter as it's laid out in the UI. So now if I move either the left or the right handle, you can now see that I'm moving both. And by the way, we fixed this. We, we had this bi-directional workflow between a set uh, drive and driven keys for quite some time. So you can key, you can middle mouse on any 
on any channel you want and, and you get all of that as well. So that's pretty handy to know. Um, some other things that we need to cover in here is on the left, on the left hand side of the play bar, um, the transport tools work slightly different. And you'll notice that as we drag the play bar, we have this really nice frame indicator. I can't tell you how many iterations we went designing this so that it just works. You know, it's got a nice pointer now. So there's no ambiguity as to when it is you're keying your character. So let's add some keyframes. Um, and so you can see here the frame indi indicator works nicely. And as well in the play bar itself, we now use the middle mouse button. And if you middle mouse click on a keyframe, you can quickly just retime it. So all of this really quick tweaking of the keyframes has seen a lot of iterations just to do what you, what you expect it to do in a dope sheet. So middle mouse, or I can just middle mouse click anywhere and then I can use my left mouse button to move this. And then the middle mouse button anywhere to shift that animation and I can move it forward. So now the dope sheet in 17 is finally in a place where I'm, I don't feel like taking my laptop and then flinging it through a window. So it works quite nicely now. So middle mouse button on there, left mouse. It just does what you expect it to do. And of course, just left click anywhere will wipe it away. And again, that middle mouse ability just to, just to quickly tweak stuff is great. And of course, right mouse button on the key now gives you a full set of information as well. So if you need to have help, if you need discovery on the play bar, just right mouse button on one of the keys or anywhere and you can disable the keys, enable the keys. And while we're at it, um, I might as well show some features that have been in there for an awful long time inside of Houdini. And something that I do want to start exploring animation inside of Houdini. I am a grunge, pretty crappy grunge animator, but nonetheless, um, I've done quite a, you know quite a few things. But you know, for instance, we can grab some keyframes, and uh, let's grab some keyframes over here, and we can actually create these things called time marks if you're not aware of them. And now they're finally discoverable. They used to be hidden in these funky icons, but now under time group, you go, hey, what are time groups? And what they are is the ability to, inside of the channel editor, to create these persistent time groups, whereby I can create a time group at any particular frame in time. And then I can select other objects. And if I, if I deselect, you can see that time group remains persistent. And I can bind other animation pieces and hang them off these time groups. And uh, then you can just quickly adjust your timing that way for doing really quick, uh, really quick adjustments. So time groups is just one of the many cool options that we have available to us inside of Houdini that are these really nice add-ons that are, are pretty powerful. But you know, we'll, we'll cover animation at a later date. So lots of really nice updates there. And the most important part of all, we have a round keyframe button. And we have a nice little menu beside it that allows us to to start peering into motion effects, which is chop. So we can add, based on the current channels that we're working on, um, we can also uh, change a lot of the various different uh, states as to how we're adding keyframes as well. And again, the most important part of all is, now I know exactly what I'm keying into at just a single click. And, uh, and it's, it's really great that way. Not too many changes elsewhere in the interface. You know, we still have uh, real time on and off. We still have the animation options as well. So we're taking feedback on that as well. Um, but at least it's now all nice in a, in a nice area. So what I want to work on next is let's take a look at the next thing on the UI. And uh, any questions so far? There are a couple of questions. You uh, got it. You mentioned the easy in and out on the animation editor. Uh, where is that? Right here on the, on the lower, uh, on the lower right hand side to the, to the, just to the right, of the play bar, you can press that and it just, it's just going in and out of that really quickly. So, and, and this is also a great way of just updating channels from selected nodes. So if you have any selected nodes, you can just press that and it'll update your channel selection based on those selected nodes. Yeah. Uh, does the selection lock work per node or per rig? How is it designed? Uh, the selection lock works per, it works per node, yeah. per node. So it's individual per node. So as you work with your node, you can, you can mute channels and unmute channels. And it's all, I think it is all in home. So if you wanted to automate that in, in some, some higher level tools like character riggers are apt to do, you can certainly do that. And another thing that we've done with a simple female, or oh, is there any more questions? Is, uh, a couple of thumbs up on the new animation editor. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, also the um, other question was, are there plans to make something like Softimage's motor mo mocap transfer system? 
Then nothing I can't talk about can't right talk about now. Plans? No. Well, to, to be honest, and, and um, so we have this thing called, called CHOPS, channel operators, which is motion effects. And it's, an, it's a very old technology that's matured nicely. In the last two releases, we've added the ability, we've modernized it by including its own VEX context. It's not a CVEX context, but it has its own VEX context, whereby we can finally work with animation as, as proper struct, structures. And there's a, really, there's a lot of nice things that went in there to support, for instance, the crowd's workflow. And as we move forward, there's, you look for a lot of activity inside of CHOPS. Um, some of the things we were dreaming about, which we would love to have in there, is, uh, for instance, per channel sampling. That would be nice to have. It would be nice to have um, uh, refactoring of CHOPS so that it's multi-threaded. Um, and also be a lot smarter as to how it updates. In other words, don't update everything. Only update those channels that have edited and don't dirty all the chops. Those are the sorts of things to, to, add, to add a lot of uh, improvements to chops, plus scalability. As we know, uh, chops has, has, a, has a bit of an overhead when it comes to managing a tremendous amount of channels. Um, one good thing, though, in Houdini 17, though, is we've, we've added full ragdoll. So it's right there on the plate for us to grab if we want it where we can actually do motion retargeting. It's on the plate. We don't have any motion retargeting tools right now, no. But with full ragdoll there um, and, some, and some momentum from you guys, if you guys and girls, if you really want this stuff, scream and yell and give us use cases. And, and we'll certainly take that into consideration as we move forward. But it's on the plate now because we have it in, in crowds. As a matter of fact, ragdoll is implemented as a C++ function exposed inside of X. And we use that VEX inside of the crowds. So it's, it's all there. And as we know, that new VEX context inside of CHOPS is available. So it, but it's now down to interfaces. And with regards to crowds, I'm not, I think that uh, Cameron is working on a crowds masterclass, so I'm not really gonna touch on this right now, but it, unless there's a real pressing need to just get into some crowds, maybe in the next little loom or something, we can do that. But yeah, lots of work there. Another question? Uh, just a clarification on the last one. So Nicholas was asking, uh, where is the ease in and out on the uh, new animation? Oh, so um, we're a bit funky that way. But anyway, let's take a look here. So I can select any curve, space G, space H. So um, we actually have the function available. So with us, you select the key or the function, and there you can do the function ease in and out. So we have ease in and then ease out. So you can actually set your, your function curves that way. So for instance, if I take this curve, pull it up here, and um, let's grab this function curve. And if I, I can select any one of these functions and I can change its, change its function around, let's say ease in. So we can ease in, and then I can select this function and choose ease out if I wanted to really do that manually. And I can also select this key and then hit the T key to untie it. And now I can set uh, different functions for each one of these different uh, handles here. So there you go. That's the T key to do ease in and ease out. Hopefully that answers the question. I mean, there's a whole slew of things we can take a look at at the channel editor once we start bonk bonking away in there. It, we really need to do something about how to, how to block in Houdini, how to, how to do pose to pose, and then how to do you know, you know, final animation as well, final animation passes as well. So at least show you the, the tools inside of Houdini to, to get, you know, for instance, targeting my artists and, and soft homage artists and, and move from there. He said that did answer his question. Thank you. Oh, good, good, good. So I want to move on. So the simple female is pretty messed up right now. Um, we actually rewrote the next two tools I'm about to show you. And if I go to the, so if you have a digital asset that's created by myself or by a, a competent Houdini rigger who's building these really cool rigs inside of Houdini. If you've never seen a Houdini a animation rig before, it's literally a digital asset with all the parameters promoted at the top. And the idea here is, um, is to not expose the insides of these. Um, as a matter of fact, we actually have the dive target off on this, so you have to actually do allow editing of contents in order to dive into it. And this is your rig. And um, rigs inside of Houdini are, it's a fantastic environment to build the most sophisticated film full on 
uh, character rigs and also simple tune rigs as well and everything in between. And uh, these networks are, are you know, easily configured. We also have the, um, and then the latest update to the, to the auto rig tools, which have the facial rigs, which we're not gonna dive into right now. Um, but inside of here, you can see we have all these different various nodes. And what I wanna do is cover some of the renaming stuff. So we've added some really cool renaming. And let's say we wanted to append a, a, a prefix. So these are called control nodes. And let's say we wanna rename them. So we have a new rename tool in here, which was written by, by Matt in documentation. And if I go to edit, and where is it? Uh, I usually just use the hotkey. Rename nodes is Alt W. And this is now all written in, in, in PyQt, and Python and PyQt, so we can find all the NIGs, all, all the things that are leading with control. And let's say we want to replace them with capital CTRL. And what we have here is a really clear way of seeing what we have before, and what we have after. And you can actually see the matches and then you can safely rename this entire rig. Will I break the rig? Most likely, <laughs> but let's try it. And then we can do Alt W again and let's see if we, this thing is a uh, re-entrant. So let's go Control and we're gonna rename it with CTRL again. So no more of that funky looking for underbars up to string, um, ignore case, ensure unique names, match whole name, find and select it, so now we can rename all of that. And now we can match current definition again. So really, really handy tools. As well, um, we also have the find tool as well. So the, the shortcut key for the find tool is the slash key. And again, we can now find all the neurals that begin with CTRL and with control. And we can see here, we now give you a full list of all the control nodes and you can actually pick on this and use this as a chooser. So this thing now does two purposes for me. I don't do this when I'm doing visual effects work. I don't do this when I'm working on regular scenes. But if I'm working on a lighting scene or I'm working on a rig, um, really, really handy to sort of uh, limit the scope of the objects that you want to take a look at. And I keep this up and running all the time. Fantastic tool for doing it. Again, rewritten in, in PyQt. So really cool tool there. Match current definition. Next thing. As I said before, in properly done rigs, you want to embed in the digital asset itself two things. In the character tools, and, and use the female rig as, as an example, um, we now have a new character picker and a new pose library, rewritten from scratch, no longer XML based. They author JSON files on disk now, so it's all JSON based on disk. And they're all refactored in Python and PyQt to be modern. We looked at all the various different character pickers out there, for example. And this character picker is a first class picker. It supports multiple selections, so I can actually hold down the shift key and make multiple selections. And now you can quickly edit and adjust those things in here with the, again with the T key or the pose handle, I can now pick that. And then you can select all the spine, the arm. For instance, the spine, you can now just do some quick rotate. So it's a full functioning uh, picker. And you can see the hands and feet are done as well, as well as the face. And of course, on the hands themselves, you can now zoom in and out, you can box select you know, the fingers. And if you take a look at the hand and if I expose those controls, you can tap the R key and you can rotate your fingers really quickly. Feet as well. And of course, the face. So you can, you can change the face work as well. I think I've got a quick question here. Yeah. When renaming, does the reference parameter change automatically? Um, say that again. When, when renaming, does the referenced parameter change automatically? Um, yes, absolutely. It's Houdini, right? Um, Houdini um, runs through the dependency chain to do um, any renaming of nodes. I think this is the only application where I don't have a, I don't have a fear of changing pretty much any string. And Houdini has this superiorly robust dependency environment where we will try and rename everything that's dependent on that node by name. And it's unlike any other application out there. And we've been doing it since I've been working at SideFX, uh, close to, close to 25, um, 24, almost 25 years going on next year. So long, long time <laughs> we've been supporting this and it's just in our nature and our blood to, to make sure that we resolve all of these different dependencies, whereas other applications are now coming to this and they're, they, they discovered nodes, first of all, in proceduralism, and now they have to deal with all the things we've dealing with three years. Another quick one. Can the character yep. picker be scaled to fit the user's workspace? Yes. It's all scalable now, not like the old one. 
I was zooming in and out. I should have resized it. As a matter of fact, I should resize it. Absolutely, you can resize this so you can zoom in and out. Yeah, so you can make this. It works for high DPI screens. I have a high DPI screen at home and on my Mac, and it works just fine. Moving it to a second viewport, um, it's like I moved it to the second window and it works just fine. Now, the second thing, um, um, oh, yeah, it's because I'm seeing the asset. The next thing is the Pose Library. And it, too, has been completely rewritten from scratch. Um, again, JSON files are saved to disk. And in this particular character, um, you can see it's a general tool, but you can drag and drop your, your tool in there, and, or you can select from here, simple female, and then you can, you can basically have a look at the uh, various different poses that are available to that. So you can have multiple folders for that particular character. And as long as these folders are identified um, or loaded into this uh, Python panel, you can share animations. So you can actually have different pose libraries from different animators working with the same character. And you can load in you know, your favorite colleagues' animation poses that day. And then you can coalesce them into a single master pose library if you want. So very, very configurable. You can see as many different libraries as you want. And it does exactly what it's supposed to do. So um, if you say you want to go to default, uh, you, can key, you can key all of this. So you can basically key all of that. And then you can go to, let's say, this frame here, standing casual. And then you can press the K key again. And very quickly, um, you, can, you can do some blocking based on these key poses. So, and then go to frame 29 and just standing casual. So now you can, you can block out between your different poses. And we have all these really nice things inside of animation I don't want to go in today, like the flip booker. And we have different ways of blocking stuff. But just to show you that this is available now and fully configurable, um, as I said, you can put your own folders in here, load in your different folders. You can even preserve chop data as well. If you have any sort of uh, chop animation that you want to refactor into your crowd agent, you can support all of that as well. So that's a simple female. And uh, so uh, definitely play around with her, have a look at the various different tools. And if you're into character rigging, uh, it's very straightforward to do all of that. So uh, the Python viewport state, this one is huge for me. Um, so I'm going to take a bit of a pause here. And this one is really, really a big deal. And what it is, is I've got a movie here that hopefully we can play. And oh, that's the, so the, what is the Python state? The Python state is, um, it allows us the ability to write our own viewport tools. It's that simple. Um, in this case, we have a, uh, a tool that was written that we ship with in Houdini that allows us to, uh, it's built on top of a custom digital asset that simply does glass shattering. As we now know, the bullet has the new destruction by material destruction toolkit where we have glass, concrete, and wood. And this is a digital asset that's wrapped around that. And what it is, it's interactively, um, you have, a, you have a, a whole bunch of different primitive shapes that you can draw upon. You can load, you can reference any handle inside of Houdini, currently not supporting custom handles, not right now. It's definitely on the, on, on the, on the roadmap. But right now, you're, you're limited to the huge subset of custom handles inside of Houdini. You can, you can author and render guide geometry. And one of the main things you want to do with the Python state is it works in its own thread. So that means um, it communicates with the parameters on the nodes. Um, how frequently you want it to. So you're no longer bound to the cooking mechanism inside of Houdini. So you're completely decoupled in this new environment. So you can map one or more parameters on your node to a single handle event. And, uh, or vice versa, you can have a single handle populate various different parameters. The second thing that you have available to you in this new Python state is the ability to fire arrays. And we are shipping one node with the Python state, I believe, which is the stroke saw. So um, let's definitely go inside of Houdini and let's put down a piece of geometry and dive inside of the new object. And let me hide everything else. You'll now notice that um, when we add a new object, there's no more file node loading in the cube. It now is an empty network. And it says, and we have some nice text in the middle of the, in the, the network environment. It says, empty network, press tab to add geometry. So what we're going to add here is we're going to add a stroke. So the stroke stop now, so the stroke stop now uses that new state tool. 
It's the new Python state tool. We're querying the viewport. And what we're doing is we're drawing a particular, this tool now has complete control. If I right mouse on it, this is all being done with the stroke tool. Um, we can see that all these various different options are defined by the tool itself. So as we add more and more strokes, you can see that the strokes are being populated on this particular node. So this Python state is running on top of the stroke saw. And as you add more and more strokes, um, we still have some issues with populating the node in terms of performance, but as far as the viewport is concerned, um, we can now use this Python state to do it. We're also firing array um, into the viewport and you can query a hit geometry, um, you can query positions of geometry. So when you hit a piece of geometry in the viewport, uh, if you do the right call inside of this new uh, HOM package or HOM environment that we're using for the stroke state, um, you can you get a dictionary back of all the different pieces that you can query from it, and uh, there's a couple example files that ship with with the with this uh, Python state in in the Houdini distribution. So definitely have a look at that, and more and more to come on this. But what this now allows us to do is we're now on the road of creating our own tools, our own interfaces in the viewport on top of the actual nodes themselves. Right now, you're fairly limited as to what you can do inside of the viewport in the Python state. Um, in the Python viewport state. Um, for instance, you can't uh, negotiate very well or very directly with the graphics, for instance. There's still a lot of work to do with the state. But right now you can, you can use geometry manipulators. We can, you can build now really nice tools. And for the very, very few of us that know the, about these bind selectors, um, yeah, you finally now have a, a way of interacting with the node in the viewport, writing your own tool. As far as the other nodes, um, slow and steady, I guess. There is the desire for us to incorporate these states in more and more of the factory nodes, um, you know, and we'll do that as, as, it, as, as we go forward. Um, but I would look for any new network types that might show up in the next year, uh, might be refactored to use entirely the Python state as the way that we build the interactive viewport states for, for any, any new network types that might be coming up in the future. So we're future safing ourselves as well. So if we do want to add more to Houdini, we can now have this really great infrastructure to lean on. So While you're on the topic, yep. uh, any timeline on switching to Python 3? Um, as far as I know, um, I believe the next major release, which would be probably Houdini 18 at some point in time, uh, we will probably be shipping with Python 3 and Python 2.7. Um, that's, uh, you know, keeping up with, uh, with uh, you know, the, there's the, the uh, what's the B, VFX community? I forget there's this, I forget the name of it, but the, yeah, the VFX pipeline. The VFX pipeline. Um, they're, they're saying that Python 3 for, for 2020, they pushed it out a year because there's quite a few company, quite a few customers and facilities that are still uh, dealing with all the old code. And you know what? We're the biggest problem. Houdini users, we keep on writing Python 2.7 code all over the freaking place. And the problem is pipelines depend on this, this really fragile code and it drives, I know it drives system engineers batty and we know it, and, but we keep on doing it. So refactoring all of that tiny little cruft that's in pipelines, that's it's mired in 2.7 and up, upgrading it to, Houdini, or to Python 3 is one of the big daunting tasks for facilities. So. And for us, yeah, we have to sweep through all of our code as well and make sure. But with Python 3 comes this thing called machine learning. And that's all I'm saying for now. But because um, it has a couple really nice toolkits for doing machine learning inside of uh, Python 3. So for us, it's going to be fairly mandatory in the, in the future to move that direction. Another question. How do you display the uh, frames per second in the viewport? Oh, that's easy. Um, in, the, in the viewport, hit the D key. D as in display options. Go to um, guides and under show time, turn that on. And also show geometry information always on. And that's how you do that. Save as default and okay. So um, I guess, so the stroke state, look for a lot more. Hopefully there's gonna be a master class coming out on that. If not, I'll collaborate with uh, one or two people in the, in the company and get something out on this short, sooner rather than later. Um, it is more of a, a technical TD tool. Um, so I'd probably structure that one where we, you know, let's see it in use so the artist can get a hold of it and then we get technical. And then so, you, you know, the artist can bow out and the technical people can lean in and have a look at what we have. But as I said before, definitely take a look in the, in the Houdini uh, 
distribution. It's huge. This is possibly my one or two top feature for Houdini 17 because I've been waiting for this for over 15 years, maybe 20 years, and we finally have it. And what? And I have a bit of jealousy because the other major software in in this in this uh, in, in in this environment has had this from the get-go. So it's nice to finally be able to write our own viewport interactivity tools. So we covered the node find tool and quick marks. Oh yeah, just a quick nod on the quick marks in the viewport. We now have a really quick way of, um, oh, I should actually do some more stuff on stuff inside of here um, with construction planes. So, and get into some of the manipulator tools. Um, uh, there's, there's a belief that we haven't done too much on the modeling tools. So I, what I wanna do now is just have a quick boo at the handles themselves and the work that we've done there. So I'm gonna put down a grid and uh, dive inside of the grid. You'll notice, um, I'm gonna cover this a bit later, but a lot of the grids now have, every single primitive now has a rotate parameter as well, as well as a, a, a position or, or translate parameter. TX, TY, TZ, and RX, RY, and RZ are now on every single generator node inside of Houdini. Yay. So that means we can finally uh, use the R key and we can finally manipulate grids and our primitives, all of our primitives can now do alignment. But what I wanna do now is add a box. And I should have put in create in context. Let me go back here. Um, there's a menu button here in the viewport, creating context. Um, I will set this on quite frequently when I know I'm gonna be doing some modeling tasks and I want everything to land up in the same piece of object. So that's creating context. And now when I go in here and I tab add a box, it's now gonna keep me in the same object. And uh, I'm gonna put this box right there. And now the box has a handle on it. I can detach the handle, or let's see the box here. I'm gonna put a transform node after it, or basically select this. And you'll notice that we have the secure selection on, so you need to tap the S key now, or you turn that off. So you always have to hit the S key now, unless you turn secure selection off. And then I'm gonna put in here transform. And as always, I'm always in the radial menus. And if I'm doing modeling, I'm gonna do poly modeling for goodness sake. I always like the poly modeling uh, C key. So that means now when I use my C radial, I'm always in the poly modeling hot, 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 you know, hot key. And I love that as well. But now I have this handle here on this transform node. Um, I can detach it with a single quote key. So we now can move this handle wherever we want. And we can turn on point snapping and it's really laborious and you know, you try and locate your handle. But what we've added now is if you right mouse on this handle and you hold down, there's a line handle. You'll notice that we have this new entry down here, which is called Start Orientation Picking. That is new for Houdini 17. And if you discover this and you start using it, it's really, really nice. And so all we need to do is just hit the semicolon or the colon key. And you'll notice that right beside the single quote detach key, at least on my North American keyboard, I do apologize for other keyboards, I'm sorry about that. Um, but if, you, if you're on a US keyboard, um, the single quote key to the left of it is the semicolon key. And if I hold or tap down the semicolon, or if I hold down the semicolon key, you can now see that we get these really cool inference markers. So I can put this handle wherever I want, just by simply clicking. Well, it should work, and, and I click. And if I tap the semicolon key, I can put the handle wherever I want. And so now that I've put it on the base, I can now hit the single key to, to attach the handle again, and now I can snap this to wherever I want. So I can now uh, take this handle, and I can now take this and I can snap it wherever I want. Or I can use the semicolon key again, and I can snap to that primitive face. And now my box is aligned to that piece of geometry. So again, it's the semicolon key is Nirvana. So I've hit the semicolon key, I'm now in this state, and I just simply have to click and I move my box. So, and also, another thing we added to the handles is we finally added the ability to constrain rotations to any, to any angle we want. And the way you access that is you hold down the control key as you manipulate the rotate. And it sets the default to go by 45 degrees. So now we can do that. Right mouse on the handle is where you're gonna find all this stuff. As I said, the line handle, it's got the starting orientation picking with the semicolon, which we added very late in the game, by the way. If there's some Houdini testers out there and you didn't see this, we added this like really late. Um, and as well, 
um, if we take a look down here, the handle parameters. And this is now seen an awful lot of work as well. We can do the translate step. So let's say we want to translate step in 0.5 units. And the angle step, we have some really nice defaults here. Let's say we want to go in uh, 15 degree increments. And the scale step, let's say we want to scale in 0.25 increments. And uh, handle alignment is per component, or we, per component is, is a good idea. And then we can close that. So now when we hold on the control key and we move a translate, we're now snapping to units, finally. <laughs> finally, we have the ability to snap stuff in units. And as well, if we go to the scale tool, uh, again, if you hold on the control key, you can now snap it up and down in units. So there you go. And that's just the control key. Really handy to know. The construction plane is no laggard either. So let's put down some test geometry, a rubber toy. Remember, I have this creating context set. So when I add the rubber toy, it's going to be, um, it's going to land wherever I want. So it's right there. And you can see everything is now built inside of the single object. And uh, these selectable templates, maybe we later on there could be another loom how do you mo how do you power model in houdini maybe we'll do a session on that too if there's enough uh you know if you guys want to see that guys and girls want to see that we can certainly cover that as well but now we have the the test geometry here now what's really cool is if i hold on the slash key i can now put my construction plane using that same marker that we had before so now i can align my construction plane. let me turn off the, the global construction plane so now if i hold down that slash key which is just below the, the single, single key for detach and the semicolon. Right below it is the slash key. So those three keys for me are, are really important. And if I zoom in on here, I can actually align. Now we can finally align a, a, the grid directly to a face. Then we can select some other faces and flatten it and do all kinds of really cool work. And as I said before, the construction plane memories are now saved with uh, control, you know, control five, six, seven, eight, nine, and zero, or control six, seven, eight, nine, zero. You can save construction plane snapshots as well. So there you go. So the same mechanism, whether I'm using the, the semicolon or pardon me, the slash key to place my, my construction plane, or I use the semicolon key to interactively move any selections with any handles that I have. Great tools, simple to use, and they also work at the object level as well, by the way. So if I add a box object here, and I want to put Flippy on top of uh, my box object. So let's go up here. And uh, so if I want to place Flip on top of my box object, what I can do here is I can select Flippy, and I can hit the single quote key, and again, hit the semicolon, and then I can press the belly of Flippy there. And now I can reattach him with the single code key and again hit the single code key or the semicolon, I can place them on there. Oh, that should have worked. I don't know what happened. My box went, but anyway, yeah, it should have worked. But anyway, yeah. let me control Z that. That should have worked. Might be my tool. Might be, I might have run into a bug, but yes, you should be able to, to place Flippy on any object that you, oh, my box is over there, I'm sorry. So let's pick Flippy again, which is this guy here. And let's detach the handle. I'll try again. And using the semicolon key, I want to pick the bottom of Flippy, reattach the handle, and then again hit the semicolon key. And I should be able to put him there. Now he works. And then I hold on the control key, and now I can just quickly align him. There we go. So we can quickly snap stuff, and that's that semicolon key. Okay, so any questions so far? Because I would like to move on, and I'm already behind. <laughs> Does align handle change the center or pivot of the object? No. Um, uh, actually, in this case, it um, when you de detach the handle, it does not. As you can see here, uh, this object does not have its pivot translate or pivot rotate change. If you do wish to change the pivot handle itself, it's the same key that Maya has, which is insert. So if I did want to change the pivot of, let's say, Flippy, I can absolutely do that. Maybe I want to change the pivot to his nose. So what I can do is I use the insert key, just the same as another application. And now that I'm in pivot mode, I can now adjust the pivot of my handle. And again, semicolon should work here. There we go. And then I, then I hit the insert key again to, now you can see that I have changed the pivot. So if I tap naturally the rotate, now the rotate is going to be around Flippy's nose. So definitely there's a lot of, I mean, we did a lot of streamlining. And because a lot of the streamlining relies on hotkeys, 
and the hotkeys are discoverable by only right mouse buttoning on here. That's why I'm showing you. There's so many things inside of any application that require uh, a lot of documentation and a lot of step-by-step -step tutorials in order to master those tools. And Houdini now is starting to be that way as well, where there's a lot of these really cool workflows where you have to know the hotkeys and the path forward. And uh, so, you know, I can take any modeling steps, maybe somebody has 40 steps in Houdini, I can get it down to like five or six sometimes, you know, and really hone in and, 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 and really get really fast modeling techniques. So, How next. How reset the world plane orientation? Oh, reset the plane uh, several ways. You can, uh, um, you can, the easiest way is to right mouse on the, on, the, on the actual construction plane here and set construction plane. And there's an option that says reset to defaults right at the very bottom. And that's the quickest way I know to reset your construction plane to the origin and start moving forward. Yeah, so right mouse on the construction plane. You can normally turn on the construction plane handle if you want to have that available all the time. Therefore, when you select and manipulate this handle, um, in the construction plane tool that is, and that's what the slash key is all about. So the slash key now enters the construction plane tool. So it used to be a long time ago, it used to be the C key, now it's the slash key. So the slash key is now, and I can actually drag any one of these manipulators and, and, and work with it as well, so, yep. Can you save construction planes as library choices? Yes, you can. Um, if I go to the, first of all, we, we have the memory toolbars for construction planes, but we also have this thing called the memory toolbar. If I press on, on the perspective where, you know, the, the middle in this case, oh, there's my lock, it's showing up now. Well, that's because I'm in a tool that uses secure selection. So you can see that lock there. Um, right down here, I can turn on the memory toolbar. And we can save views, we can save the construction plane as well. So we have the construction hotkeys, by the way. But if you really want to always work on a construction plane that's, uh, let's say you have a construction plane over here, and you want to save that, you can actually uh, save it, uh, you can actually click and save it into that spot there. So save into the spot there. And then you can hold the slash key, go to there, and then you can press save there. And now you can go to the various different construction planes. So you can save them there. And we also have the control 67890 hotkeys for saving construction planes as well. And we got another hand raised. I got one more. Uh, is it possible to get uh, from, for example, three point selected gizmo to be exactly in the center of those three points? Um, yeah, I believe if you have a, tr a triangle, if you have a triangle tries and you're using the slash or the semicolon, you can, it will select the very center of any primitive face that you have. So when we are using the, let's say, I don't know if that's, that answers the question, but if we take a look at the box here and we do triangular boxes, so let's do triangles on our boxes. And if I want to move the, let's say the T key on there, it's actually a transform. And if I now detach my handle, or select my handle and detach it. And now I use the... What key is it to detach? It's the single quote. Handle is not detachable. Well, that's great because I wanted to select everything and do a transform. There we go. The handle, the handle on, the, on the box objects are not, uh, not there because they don't have an origin. They don't have a rotate origin or scale origin, by the way, or pivot, pivot center, but the transform does. So now I can use the single quote to detach, and hopefully I should be able to use the semicolon. There you go, you can actually select the center of those three, three points there. And now you can move your, your handle there, you can reattach it, and now you can rotate your box. Or I was doing a construction plane there at one time. But yeah. That's it, move on. Okay, lots more work to do there for sure. But let's keep on going, top 10, Loom. Um, so UI, we, we took a lot of look at the UI. So now we want to take a look a bit of look at Bullet. Um, so some of the interesting things that we've done with Bullet is the Voronoi fracturing now. Um, we can actually now, some features. Okay, I have to do VLC. That's fine. Um, open with VLC. So there's some really nice options that we've added to Voronoi fracturing. One of them is the ability to change the various uh, well, I can't do it. So maybe I will, we'll cover the bullet stuff a bit later. I'm gonna come back to this because I can't play my movies for now. Um, and, uh, for, oh, actually let's, let's go to sourcing first. So sourcing is now, as you, as you know, know, and that's, it's caused uh, some controversy and some, some issues 
on in the group and in, in the Houdini community. Uh, and I wanted to take a look at just some of the sourcing workflows that we have available to us. And I'm going to turn off my instruction plane handle and, and actually take a look at a bit of the madness that we've added to <laughs> sourcing inside of the various different uh, fluid solvers and uh, the various different solvers itself. Let's stick with Pyro because that's the one that a lot of users are, are having issues with. And let's do the simple sphere uh, Pyro setup. And then let's take a look as to what we're doing and why the decision, why we made the decisions we did in refactoring the sourcing in Houdini 17. So Pyrox, by the way, sourcing is, I, it's, it's so much faster by using points and VDB grids into the, in, as sourcing into the simulation environment. So I'm gonna say, uh, let's actually do a, a billowy smoke. And it wants us to select the sphere, hit enter. And what we get now is uh, a simple simulation. Hopefully it's not too different than what we've done before. And uh, we still get sourcing. The Pyro solver itself hasn't seen too much update except OpenCL finally really works now. <laughs> so if you go into advanced, um, hopefully we have um, OpenCL on under, where did I, I always forget where it goes. Let's go under simulation. Oh, it's under Pyro object, sorry. And let's go under, no, it should be under the solver. Simulation combustion. I believe, I'm just trying to see that we turned, I think it's under advanced. Yeah, use OpenCL, it's right in front of my face. Um, so use OpenCL is off by default, please turn it on, especially if you have a decent graphics card. And, uh, now you get much faster simulations with OpenCL. And you notice now the behavior is pretty darn good now. We had a, a, a bug or an error in, in OpenCL in the previous release whereby um, you would lose a lot of the behavior in your fluid simulations. So now that's, that's adjusted and corrected. So now you get roughly the same bulk animation. So absolutely use OpenCL on by default. It gives you much, much faster playback for sure. But now about the sourcing. So you notice here that under volume source, it's, it's brand new for Houdini 17. And the old stuff is still in there, but it's simply hidden. So we haven't uh, deprecated, removed it from the software. It's still there, but it's hidden. But now this is aligning with the new way in which we're working. So instead of this node itself constructing all of the data that it needs to go into the simulation, um, it now expects you to build your VDB grids in SOPS. Um, and it's not just volumes, because volumes are quite slow um, in comparison to the DDB grid workflow that we now have introduced inside of 17. So this is all completely new. And it's a lot easier to manage now. You used to be, you have to go between the various folders. I think there was four folders you always needed to go to to make things, ma make things work. But now you can see that we're using these nice multi-listers to see density, temperature, and, and velocity. So everything you need to work with that sourcing of that attribute is now in one place. You're no longer having to toggle between the three folders. That's a, that, that is a huge improvement. As well, we still have the particles to support the flip workflows. Remember if we're doing flip or any of the, uh, the particle type workflows, we still have sourcing for particles is in there and also instancing. If we choose to do instancing for, for, for distributed type simulations, you know, when we're doing instance containers for doing, um, uh, you know, multiple containers for, for doing um, clustering is also in there as well. So that's been refactored. So it's all should be working out of the box now. But you'll notice that uh, we really don't have, we only have one control, which is scale. So that's the only thing that we have available to us right now. So it's much simplified workflow. So that means it's all in SOPs now. So if we go to our sphere object, this is where we now have all of our control. So we've wrestled out a lot of the niggly stuff in DOPS and we've put it now on SOPS. And you can see here's the sphere which we created off the shelf. And we have, instead of just having the old uh, pyro source, we now have three discrete nodes. So from the sphere, the first thing we do is we create density. And when we do that is we actually are scattering points. We dive inside of this, you can see that what we're doing here is we're simply uh, grabbing the surfaces and we're scattering points on the surface. Then we add noise into that. And there is a whole bunch of options in here. And this thing right over here, I don't know if you see this, but um, 
we've taken some some questions. Well, where's the visualization? Where's color pieces? Where? How do you see anything? You know, we've removed all the color attributes from from all of the notes to see what the heck is going on. And the answer is, we've finally refactored these these um, visualization uh, options that we've added a couple of releases ago. We've now put it on the actual parameter itself. So if you want to visualize those attributes, this it looks like a Google Maps thing, right? So, but anyway, this this uh, this turns on and off the visualizers per parameter. So no more cooking of a node if you just want to see the color of your pieces. No more cooking of a node. So Visualize Pieces uses this as well. And wherever we could, we've now added these really nice visualizers in line with the parameters. Again, this is like along with the viewport states, what I do all the time, I love visualizers, and now they're there based on any attribute parameter you can immediately turn them on. So it, this is a huge, huge feature for me. I love it, I love it. So now you can actually quickly see any visualization there and turn it on and off. And it's per node, so as soon as you drift off that node, you can see that the visualizer goes away. And of course, you can right mouse on this and you can show the operator tree and, or I didn't want to do that, so, so I'm gonna hide the operator tree. But anyway, so you can right mouse on there and uh, oh, actually there's no menu on it, just turn on and off. And then, so that's the attribute noise. And this is using the new attribute noise SOP, which was written specifically for this case. It does 99% of what it is that you want to do. In other words, it, it allows you to add all kinds of noise in, and if you take a look at it, it's finally a nice high level wrapper around the VEX and VOPS for adding all the different noises that we normally add, such as curl noise. So it's a one-stop solution for us now to add any sort of noise, so the pulse duration. So I think one of the issues that everybody's running into is when you're adding noise, such as temperature, and you can't see anything, now you know. You just simply turn that on, now you can have a pretty good idea as to where and what you're adding. Um, for instance, the minimum and maximum, pulse duration, element size. So you get a pretty good idea um, as to how many points that you're, you know, what you're doing. And if you just want to see more points, add more points. So you can actually increase the particle or decrease the particle separation to let's say one, two, five, and generate a lot more points. And now, and you can see here, you can change the element size of your noise. And so you can get pretty much where you want to go really quickly. Now the third node that, we're do, that we have here is what creates the actual VDB volumes. And if we hit the display flag on this, we can see we now have the VDB volumes. And we work away. I haven't used the middle mouse button yet, but if I middle mouse button on a node, we get these really nice, uh, you know, we get the node information. But if we hit the I button on, this, on the rasterized node, we've added some really nice, super powerful options to the attribute visualizer for the node as well. First of all, we always have the debug state, so you can actually see the debug information if you want to. But we've added this really new, this really cool option in here, which is called show modifications to attributes. When we do that, and let's pin this, when we do that, we can now see what attributes were created here and which attributes were destroyed. So the destroyed attributes actually have a green strike through, and the ones that were added have an underline on them. So we know what attributes were created and what were destroyed. As you know, many times as we're working on these nodes, you're always hitting the middlemost button, and you know, the, the node before you say, okay, there's density, P, P scale, temperature, and you never know what was created and what was destroyed. So when we do the, the create, and by the way, the middle mouse currently doesn't support it. I believe this is a bug. Please somebody submit it <laughs> because you do not get that option with the middle mouse, but you do get it with the I button. So right now, the only way to get into this is with the I button. You can say show modification attributes. Now we can see that this node has created a new density attribute. It's created a new p-scale attribute. It's created a new temperature attribute. You can click on them and you can rice model, copy link location. And, and there's a whole bunch more debug information that we've added as well here. If you hit the information button here, lots of debug information available to you. So now you no longer have to do the chasing middle mouse up and current node. You can see what's going on again. Let's take a look at add noise. We can see there that it's, it's added uh, or it's modified density, P scale and temperature. So the, the attributes that it's modified it are bolded. So we can see that it's modified uh, density and temperature. And there you go. And P scale was left un, unscathed. Um, maybe there's a way to change P scale and we can pin this and see if we can, I don't think there is under add noise. Yeah, no, so, oh well, because it's not, oh, element size. 
no, that's not changing the piece scale. So the basically, yeah, so lots and lots of information on the middle mouse button now, huge, imp huge feature increase. But as he said, um, now um, we see the B2B grids and remember it's all in the sourcing. So if we now do the, now what we can also do is do whatever it is that we want. We have create density. So let's say we wanted to add our own particles. So let's actually do, um, let's do an ISO offset on our sphere and let's scatter some points inside of it. So ISO offset, as you know, defaults to creating a volume. So if I move the display flag into here, and then we can scatter inside of that volume as well. So we can increase the number of divisions on here if we want to make a high resolution. And then we can scatter inside, let's scatter, let's say 3000 points inside of here. And we just simply merge these two together. So anything goes now. And because we've moved to a complete point-based approach, and by the way, scatter, we should create um, the output radius, which adds this P scale attribute. That's pretty much mandatory. So make sure to turn that on if you are doing scattering inside of Pyro. And now you can merge these points in as well. And then you can add your noise to the entire cloud of particles and the output density. Another thing you can do is you can have some particles shooting off into space. And for that, we can actually, um, we can add some other tools, which we're gonna take a look in a bit for, for modifying some particle stuff. But this is the whole purpose to moving to this new workflow is now we can add anything we want. And if we um, want to add some more particles that are spraying out with a pop network. So let's uh, say the scatter, let's knock it down a bit. Let's say go to, let's say 30. And we're gonna put down here pop, uh, or oh, pardon me, uh, pop network. I think this is the new one. Yeah, it's pop net. And we can wire this inside of here. And now we can use a, a really simple particle network. And if we press forward, scatter, pop net inside of this. Should give me particles. Oh yeah, I need to add some velocity. So let's add a new, um, we added a new, uh, a new um, point velocity node for Houdini 17. So this is brand new as well. And what it allows me to do is quickly add some point velocities as well. So uh, let's add some curl noise. And let's, uh, let's actually add some conical noise. So we can add some conical noise. And conical noise can use the direction attribute, which is N. So let's add uh, surface normals. So let's do the normal soft. And let's add them as point normals because I'm suspecting that this is gonna want point normals. And now the point velocity will allow us to do little fanned conical uh, so if we take a look at the point velocity now, and uh, we're doing conical noise, and let's turn on our velocity vectors. And now you can see here that we have nice conical noise on our points. And if we want to birth particles randomly in, that, in, in different directions, let's just do a uh, point replicate. Just to prove what's going on here. And I'm just going to point replicate some points on here. I just want to create a whole bunch of points in the same location. So points, and let's actually go to shape and let's make this really small. So now you can see here that we're basically birthing out based on, oh, and the normal should be there just fine. I'm just wanna make sure that we have correct normals on here. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm a boob. I put the normal after the scatter should be before. So now oh, actually it should be on here. And I'm getting cross, but anyway, let's do this. So um, we can actually now in the pop in the, in the in the point velocity, we can now see that we get these nice little conical things. And let's do the point normal here by points. Let's do vertex by point, and make sure I got my normals. I do, and so the point replicate hopefully has normals as well, which it does not. So oh yeah, because it doesn't support the normals. Ooh. It should though, attributes, copy source attributes, there we go. And now I have my normals and then the point velocity and uh, direction. I noticed that I had to, N doesn't seem to want to work. So let's actually, um, under normal, yeah, I'm just gonna leave it for now. But the point velocity should give us nice little conical velocities going outwards. And uh, I found that normal sometimes gives me a bit of a problem and change the direction here, but normal should work. And you can adjust the cone angle and then the scale. So now we can blow particles out in that direction. And now when we take a look at our pyro, we're now gonna get something crazy. <laughs> so 
Uh, let's press forward. And now you get your particles blowing out. And so you can create a whole bunch of different types of simulations just by simply mixing and matching the various different points in your sources. So being able to just quickly play in there and create your own environment and still have it go very, very fast is really important for us to, to work inside of there. And that sourcing works everywhere else as well. So now I wanna go, I found the latest Windows update really slow when I hit the tab or the Windows tab to move over. And I think it's that history thing that's cutting into me. Retime. So now that we're inside of fluids, um, might as well jump right into the retime node. The retime node, if you have not discovered it yet inside of Houdini, is, again, let's write up there with everything else. It is, it is a critical tool to deliver shots. So in this particular case, we have a simple pyro source, pyro sim, and then we have a pyro import, which is actually bringing in the results from our simulation. And let's make sure I turn off my sphere object. Dive inside the pyro import. Now I've got import pyro fields. And we actually have a new retime node. So if we go into our, uh, what's it called again? Yeah, retime. I'm pretty sure I typed in retime. Retime. And um, so if I do the retime node, display that. The retime node is a general node that can retime anything from polygons to volumes but we need to know what we have to do in order to retime things. So if I move my display flag to the import fields, we can see that we have all of our fields coming in. And with the retime node, um, we need to tell it to work on volumes. So the interpolation, as we see now, we've got much higher order interpolation methods. So we can go to cubic. And under volumes, <clears throat> the blend mode, um, we can actually do by, by voxel position or advected. And to do proper volumes, you do it vected. And now we can change this. So now we actually have no speed change whatsoever. And now we can, we can reduce the speed of this, let's say, uh, let's say reduce it by to 0.1. And now we can have our volume retimed. We're scaling it down tremendously slower. As a matter of fact, I should up the resolution on my, on my simulation because it's way too low. Let's go inside of my pyro object and let's set the division side to something a little bit more interesting like 0 0.25, like a 2.5 centimeters. And let's go into the pyro import. This thing is worth everything inside of solutions. So now with this, it's completely rewritten. Um, it, it's, uh, it holds together with some ridiculously slow uh, retiming and uh, let's set it to, let's say 0.5, let's cut it down in half speed in half. The new input frame range is 100. So, so now you can do some really nice retiming. And all of this, you can do many different ways of retiming. Let's go to that frame. If we go up, you can see here that the simulation is only a, a, you know, simulated to frame 23, yet we're on frame 33. So we can retime by frame, by speed, by shift range, and by fit range. So many different ways to do that. By speed, I think, is the most um, is, is the most easiest to get around. And I actually should put 240 here. And now when we do that, we can actually now set the speed implicitly that way. And it does really nice interframe blending, no more hits, and you can use your interpolation method that you wish to, to choose. And we do a proper advection method between the volumes. So retiming now works very, very well. And as I said before, you can retime pretty much anything you want. You can retime by transform only. So if we had, uh, some deforming geometry, you can retime that as well. Packed primitives can be retimed. So it's really a general tool that can be used and you can change the interpolation method. You can do subdivision interpolation as well. So using a subdivision uh, uh, function type interpolation, so. Yep. Retime is huge. And it's so easy to use, you just put it down. Now SOPs. And uh, are there any questions on retime? We actually had some questions from uh, the previous section. Oh gosh, okay, let's uh, get those first. So quickly, regarding sourcing for flip, uh, Dave said he relied heavily on the velocity multiplier that is no longer present in the new sourcing workflow, and the possibility of bringing it back. Maybe uh, submit that as an RFE. Yeah, submit as an RFE, but uh, that's the, the velocity control over the, that was in the, 
Yeah, I can see. I mean, add, add noise doesn't really have a velocity scale, does it? No. Yeah, submit an RFE for that to see if we can get that in there. Right now, you could do it with a wrangle, you're right, but it would be nice to, to have uh, backwards compatibility feature wise anyway. Yeah. Uh, this is, uh, I remember from your old webinar about volumes, how to, how, how to make now source with super fast moving object. Do we just trace, as you said, in the old workflow, or is there some new workflow for that instead of doing sub steps? Okay, so for super fast moving objects, um, there is some really nice enhancements to all of this. Um, so let's take the sphere and let's make it really blitz across the, the scene in the Z direction. So let's put in here, let's say a dollar sign uh, T times two. Really blitzing, I'm not really blitzing, but, but you can see here I'm, I'm moving the sphere. And it goes for slow and fast moving spheres as well. Um, we did a lot of really cool tricks and you do need to add this by the way. So if you put on a trail and you wire that down, you put that in there. Um, the trail um, basically want to compute the velocity. So that hasn't changed, but, um, and I usually do central difference. We now have, and I'm so, so glad you guys asked this question because we are going to get into, we might as well cover this. Um, we added some really sneaky stuff in here. Um, and you wonder why we did this. Compute acceleration. So we now added compute acceleration because we did a ground up rewrite of all of our retiming code. And this has even affected the way Mantra does motion blur. But for, for Mantra, when we're motion blurring any geometry inside of Mantra, if you pass in this Excel attribute, it will actually render curved motion blur now. But you need this Excel attribute. So this is snuck in there. Turn it on. If you can afford the attribute um, memory, turn on compute acceleration. That means any of this geometry can now render in Mantra with really nice arcs. And then goes for points and sparks and all that stuff. So that's huge. And then we can compute the angular velocity as well. And then uh, those are two really important things to turn on for fast moving objects that have rotations because all the tools further on down will now support that. So hopefully that's all you need to do in order to uh, get things to, to behave correctly. And now you can see that we have the nice velocity fields in there and uh, hopefully um, when we add the noise, um, it'll take into account. And I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna cut this, this link off for now. We add the noise and then we rasterize on that. And hopefully the velocity fields are in there or the, velo the, the velocity fields are in there and they will take into account that velocity. So if we now go up into the PyroSim and so. See, we got some really nice handling of the velocities now. And of course, if you want to punt more in the opposite direction for the velocities, you can do that as well. So as I said before, velocities just work a lot better inside of Houdini 17. As for really fast moving objects, yeah, you're probably going to have to subframe your sources and, and uh, increase your, your global time steps, remember? You might want to increase your global time steps on your simulation here, let's say to 0 0.25 to maybe give it, uh, oh, pardon me, sub steps on the wrong way. <laughs> Set it to four or five, um, three or, you know, for fast moving objects, sub steps really do help as well, right? Um, for fast moving objects and you can do that and you can get away from those discrete steps as well. So there you go. And then you get much better inter, inter frame workflow. For fast moving objects, definitely um, add some global stop steps and, and, and increase your CFL a bit so you can predict where you need to put your sub steps. But yeah, velocities are a piece of cake now. It's just trail stop, go. Yeah, next back, question. Back on visualization, is there any option to visualize one out of many attributes? Um, I think right now the visualizers that we have, the cheap and cheerful visualizers we have added to all those different parameters now are pretty much uh, tied into just those attributes that are there. For instance, the add noise. Um, this is density and temperature, but if you wanted to see individual ones, you, I think you'd have to add the visualizers on top of the node itself. So if you go in the visualizer tool here, right mouse on this, you can actually add a visualizer uh, directly on that node, or you can, you can add a global one, for instance, let's say, uh, so if I press on this, and then I want to add, for add noise, I can press on this, and then I can add a new color attribute, and here I can set this to, I don't know what I want, temp. 
and you can choose the attribute from there. Or in this case, I'd have to type it in. And now you can visualize your temperature attribute as red. So you, there's nothing stopping you from doing that, right? And there's a few other different ways to get into that. And now this visualizer will live, well, it lives on the node, but I could have actually made it a global one as well. So if you right mouse on this, and uh, so let's add a global one for the sphere object. So, or let's add one to the scene for temperature and we can turn that on. There we go. So now temperature's on for the scene. Well, at least it should be. but it is on the node now. So if you wanted to add it per, per component, you can do that as well. So on retiming, is it important for the retime node to use cache file or all working good in real time with other connections? It's uh, buyer beware. I, wouldn't, I would never, if I was doing a massive simulation, I think the retiming works best on cache files. As a matter of fact, I probably wouldn't use it any other way than on caches because with the retime node, it now, if you're doing some wedging, you can now create a, a bonfire and it could just be a default bonfire, maybe rendered really, really coarsely, really quickly. And then you can retime to slow it down or speed it up however you want. And it works best if you cache it on a disk. So obviously the file cache is always the, the key tool to use there, and you can generate your caches that way. So always cache your files to disk. Import Pyrofields actually has caching saved inside of it. So you can save the disk. It actually has the file cache saved inside of it. Um, but if you want to explicitly put one down here, you can do that as well but definitely work on cache files when you're retiming um, and, and work on libraries. I mean, that's what it's for, um, you know, especially for games. Imagine being able to retime an entire forest with just a single single uh, pyro simulation and just retime it and scale it slightly differently. Yeah, with the new blending tools we have, yeah. Um, for pyro retiming, any tips on avoiding pulsing with the vector blend mode it shows up with the default colored smoke shelter? Um, Basically, the interpolation, try using either cubic or subdivision, and that should get rid of most of the pulsing whatsoever. I do find that you're still pulsing on some sources. So if you're blitting your sources in like full on, um, then, then, then yeah, you, you could see some of these pulsing. Maybe it's best to, um, to slowly or add a lot of feathering around your sources so they don't, so when you're entering new fluid into your simulation, it doesn't look really hard. I find that I get some pulsing on sources in the retime. But if you, if you sort of blend them in smoothly, then um, it, it helps a lot. But I'm finding very little pulsing in, in, in the results that I get, the rendered results, that is, so I'm retiming now. Does retime work with flip fluids? Yes, it works with everything. Um, as I said, it, you can retime geometry, you can retime flip fluids, you can retime bullet sims. Let's actually do a quick bullet sim. I'll save this file in case somebody wants it. Not here. Yeah, it works on, on bullet as well. So file new, and let's put down a box. Ah, just a, I said I wouldn't cover this, but let's take a look. Just some bullet stuff quick. And because we've added some, some really nice new fractured tel shelf tools, let's go to collisions at a ground plane. Let's pick, our, let's pick our box. Oh, remember secure selection, I have to hit the S key. Still getting used to it. I've got 20 years of unlearning to do. Um, so, um, so the yes key to pick the box, or I can turn secure selection off. It's now showing up in my viewport. I don't know why I wasn't there before. Oh, it's because I'm in a state, again, a state that uses secure selection. So anyway, I got my box object. And now if I go under, um, if I go under deform, um, we now have uh, the old shatter tool, but we now have a new tool that allows us to, uh, to basically break up all of our, our, all of our rigid body objects. So uh, rigid body, dun dun, goes under. Oh, shatter. So now we have, uh, see if we get interior cusp bound exterior normal. So we've done some work on the, on the Voronoi fracture as well. We exposed some, some new options in here that allow us to change some of the fracturing attributes, triangulation, auto detect, but anyway, yeah. So now play forward. Oh, let's actually turn, I'm sorry. Let's turn that into, uh, Already, um, let's do um, let's do already objects. Press forward. So we had a simulation. Let's now go inside of here, and let's do a retime. Works on everything. So now we can uh, let's put a file cache just to prove the point. 
that you should be caching your stuff before retiming. And, and then you can do the retime. And uh, again, in the retime, let's set it 1 to 240, 1 to 240, and let's rely wholly on our speed. Let's set it down to half speed. Now we press forward. And I need to change the attributes. So we're retiming. Let's turn on real time, I'm sorry. So there's your slow down, and this is your speed up. So you can retime it however you want. It works on pack primitives, it works on everything. So retime away. It's a bit of a blip there. I guess that's because my interpolation is linear. So let's try, uh, let's do a cubic. Now the reason why you get the linear blip, oh geez, uh, uh, how long do we want to spend? <laughs> but anyway, use cubic and we do the proper interpolation of, of the curves as well. So there you go. Yeah, you can retime anything. Geometry, characters, deformation, whatever you want. And it's keyframeable too. We actually have a, a, an option in here that can do by time, uh, by speed, and by shift range, and there's also a fit range. And uh, yeah, pretty cool, pretty cool tool. And it's refactored in a lot of different places as well. And let's do by speed. And okay, so any more questions? Move on? Let's move on. Okay. I mean, if you guys want, we can dig deep into some of these uh, different areas a later on. Uh, but I do want to cover the softs. And this is, um, this is a lot of fun as well. So uh, as you know, I love all the softs. So let's run through all of these various different softs. So let's go file new. And um, let's, uh, let's go into here. And so first and foremost, I'm going to double click on this. Let's open up new scene files as we go. The every single SOP inside of Houdini, including generators, now have a rotate tool. So this is a particular file that I have here um, that puts down all the primitives and shows you they all now will have a radi will have a center, which is a T channel, and a rotate, which is an R. Circle, box, grid, tube, all of them. So that means as we place them, we can orient them and align them. We can't change their or we can't change their pivots, including the font SOP actually has the ability now to uh, do a rotate scale and, 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 you know, and be able to place your font however you want on that first click. So we can orient all those primitives as we place them down, including the platonic solid. We even caught that one. It's got a rotate parameter. One thing that's a bit annoying, though, is um, we historically kept the order in these parameters, which sort of drives me, uh, you know, it's my, I think I got a little bit of uh, an issue there, but I like to see things in order. You can see the spheres radius, center, and rotate. Platonic solid is radius, position, rotate. Tube is center, rotate, radius. And you see, you know, I guess we kept to the, for the documentation, keep the parameter. It would have been nice maybe to organize them all in the same way. One that didn't get covered is the line SOP, but that kind of makes sense. You're drawing lines. Now, all of the transform type SOPs now match what we did in objects. And as you know, in the previous release on objects, we added, um, pre, there's pre transformability we added the pivot translate and pivot rotate. So we separated those two out. So in this release, we've now gone through all the various transformers, uh, starting with the transform SOP, we've now added a pivot transform and a pre-transform. So now we can round trip between object parameters and the transform SOP, as well as going between other applications when we were saving out Alembic files. Um, many times we needed to support the pivot translate and the pivot rotate. We now can properly round trip uh, proper transforms between other applications in us. So again, soft transform has that. Um, edit pivot has that. Even the edit SOP has it. Pivot transform with a pre-transform on every edit you do, you can expose that. I don't know why it's needed, but it's there. It's to support the handle, by the way. So the handle, when you detach it, you can actually detach the pivot as well. Maybe we should show you that in the transform tool. Let's hit the, we can, we can decouple, we can right mouse on the handle. And as you saw before, we can uh, go to pivot mode with the insert, but we can also detach the, the actual, um, um, so we can do pivot mode. Um, so you can we can change the pivot, but you can also, change the, the pivot rotate as well. So if I right mouse on there, where's the pivot rotate? It's in here somewhere, move. Where is it? There's a pivot mode for the rotate as well. 
handle parameters. I forget where. Yeah, but you can actually change the pivot rotate as well by the handle as well. I simply forget what that that option is. And uh, privet, and primitive sop has it as well, as well as copy and transform. So everywhere that you have a proper transform inside of the sop, we've we've gone through and we've added all of these different things so that we can round trip pretty much everything that, that's available to us. So let's do file open. Um, and the next one I want to take a look at is uh, blend type SOPs. So create an example file, and I will distribute this right after the, the webinar. And uh, so we can have a look at this. Um, here's a simple example file that shows you, um, because there's no example file right now in blend shapes, I built this one from scratch. And so in this case, we have a rubber toy. And we have a left arm blend, which I just simply used an edit SOP with soft transform. And I put up the right arm a bit here. And now if we take a look at uh, the blend shapes, as you know, we have this nice option here, which is this update channel names from inputs. So definitely use nulls and that. So if you're building uh, facial rigs or blend shape rigs, please name your nodes. You get a really nice uh, menu option there to update all your inputs. And now you can see here, we can now change this. But we now use the same interpolation methods as the blend shapes, as Mantra does, as everything does. So now we can choose really, really sophisticated interpolate rotation of normal quaternions and transforms. So we now do a much, much better job of, of doing the intermediate transforms. So now we're doing proper quaternion blending and it's much, much improved inside of Houdini 17. But we've also refactored the blend shapes a lot further. And by the way, that same code base is now in, in sequence blend. So if we input blend shapes, we now can do, it uses the exact same Box. We even support voxels as well, so volume blending in here. Same as we saw with the retime sop. It's using all the same code. And the interpolation I set here to cubic as well. Now, this is a bit of a funky setup. We also said we can blend anything. We can blend packs even. And guess what? Blend shapes even has a way forward to work with pack primitives. It's slightly obtuse, but it's certainly effective nonetheless. Um, the very fact that we can pass in their, in their blend shapes, the first one is going to be the raw geometry itself. Then we can pack, um, for instance, I have these edits and now I'm just adding pack, packs of these various different set, setups and they're encased inside of a pack primitive. And now we can add a weight attribute. So in this case, I use the attribute expression to add this attribute called weight. And, and actually, if you take a look at the help of the pack primitives, it tells you to add the attribute called weight. So I've done that. And now you can actually have a value here, a constant value. And that will determine the weight that we want to blend these things. So um, how much this, this snapshot of this pack primitive, how much of this snapshot of this pack primitive, merge them together and wind them into the blend shapes. And all we need to do is just simply turn the, the blend shape merge to one. Now I can select any one of these guys and now I can add the weight right on top of the pack primitives. That opens up this whole door for doing crowd blending, crowd agent blending, pack primitive blending. So as I said before, when we can do retiming, blending, anything goes now. So, and it's all in a single unified environment and that is huge, it's a huge deal. So now we can refactor crowd agents and, and, and do all kinds of really cool tweaks and stuff. And this is all to support the pose-based deformation workflow, which I don't even have a hope and getting to <laughs> in today. That's a, that's, a, that's a webinar in itself, is looking at the, the new uh, post-character workflow, post-based deformation and that. That's, that's all completely in there, but it's relying heavily on everything that I've showed you here so far. So I'm While gonna, we're on this topic specifically, yes. uh, does blend unpack geometry on the fly or is it actually working on pack geometry? It's actually working on the pack geometry. It's working on the intrinsic attributes. If you take a look at, um, um, it's actually peering inside of the packed object directly and moving it that way. So it's, it's, it's internally unfolding the geometry, but it also uses, um, if you take a look at the primitive data here, we have all kinds of intrinsic data. And uh, let's take a look at the intrinsic uh, transforms. So there's a lot of intrinsic data that can be peeled, that you can peer into. And, and that's what the, what the blend shapes is doing with regards to the packs. It can actually peer into the, into the, uh, into the, uh, um, the archives without unpacking them. And this is important because there's, uh, there's another type of uh, geometry format that's becoming more and more useful out there, which is USD. And as you know, you can download the USD plugins for Houdini and use the USD SOPs directly in Houdini right now. So USD is definitely something that we need to um, 
keep keep an eye on and make sure that uh, we support. And I see this, I see USD is just another, and geometry side is just another pack type. So, you know, you never know that might show up sooner rather than later. So, and uh, more questions, and I want to go to the next just one. Just a quick one. Can H17 hip files be read on H16? We don't touch any of the new parameters like the new rotate on shapes. Um, yes. Um, yes, absolutely. You will get some... Um, Arguments, for instance, if um, if you put down, if you have a SOP network has a transform SOP, remember we added all of those new pivot rotate and uh, pre-transforms. You'll just get some some errors you can ignore. Warnings that says this parameter unsupported, this parameter unsupported. If you ignore those, yeah, you can just keep on going. The nice thing about it though, is that in that 16.5 file, and this is how crazy Houdini is, those parameters are not supported on that node. They'll actually land up as spare parameters or they'll be hidden spare parameters. So when you reload it into 17, they'll show up again. It's pretty crazy software. So polynit, I'm not gonna bash that because Fiona's already done a great job at showing you some of the polynit stuff. So um, and it's actually, for, for us, for me, it's that way that we can now get some really cool interactive modeling uh, tools. But I'm gonna take a look at attribute noise. It's a new SOP. And as I said, you're gonna get all these files. And uh, this one's a really cool uh, contribution. I don't know where this file came from. Every file I build except this one is questionable. I don't know if I did it, but it's so trivial, it doesn't matter. Um, so there's a grid, transform, and arrest. So we have arrest attribute. Attribute noise is a new SOP. As I said, we saw it being used. It's one of the tools inside of the, the new tools that we use for sourcing. But attribute noise, it's just fun. If you just want to create some random attributes, it's so easy to just add attributes to anything that you want right now. So you can put down a sphere and let's make it polygons and let's give it a lot of divisions and let's display that. And you just put down the attribute noise. As I said before, it covers 99% of what it is we want to do without having to do anything. And as I said before, use a CD, but we can actually put in here foo. And it'll actually lift its own attributes. And again, remember if we hit the info button here, show modified attributes, we can see that we just, the plus means we just added foo here. And uh, so, so now you can visualize foo really quickly. And there you go. And uh, lots of different options. So we can do some cellular noise, look at F1 versus F2. And if we add enough divisions in here, let's add 200 by 200. Let's get some, some serious geometry in here. And now you can see, and let's turn off, uh, Let's just go to smooth shaded. And now you can turn the visualizer on and now you can have a lot of fun with your noise. And you know, the amplitude change it in one or the other. And so this is like all singing and dancing. There's a couple of things that it doesn't do that uh, in some ways I wish it did, um, but it gives you a distribution ramp as well. So you can remap the noise and you can do all the funky stuff that we're all used to using. And so you can create some some discontinuities in here by moving these two points pretty much on top of each other. You can create some hard edges and yeah, all the fun stuff you can do with noise um, is now pretty much there. So, and we also have, a, it's a nice, you can also add some turbulent noise using a loop. So you can do recursive uh, noise as well. Build your own FBM type uh, fractal noise. Let's go up here and uh, convex decomposition. Oh, it does this to me once in a while. So, oh, because I tried to open up a folder. Stupid Jeff. So here I've modeled a quick chair. And let's see what, uh, as we know, if, um, let's put down a convex decomposition. We have the convex hull, which we've always had before, and you can actually see the convex hull. This is what bullet would create if we did nothing to it. And as we can see, bullet would be using this as a collider, which is not very good. But now we added the convex decomposition. And the convex decomposition is a first class tool that we can now create a different variation of this geometry that is both performant inside of bullet. And uh, so we can say the max concavity, we can now start sucking this down and then we can get it to a point where it looks pretty good. And I'd say that's pretty good. Now we can see that there's a whole bunch of different pieces in here, um, you know, polygons, but we can actually um, choose convex hulls or segmented geometry. There's different ways we can do this. Segmented geometry doesn't, doesn't solve any overlaps, whereas convex hulls 
does a bit better of a job. Oh, I did a better job. And if we want to see the attributes again, there's that handy dandy visualize the attributes. So you can actually turn that on. Remember, this does not cook the saw. So that's why we're doing this now. So you can actually turn that up on that. And of course, we now feed this into bullet and we're good to go. So convex decomposition. So let's go back up and let's do extract transforms. Ah, we're going to pass extract trans. Ah, let's do extract transforms. Oh, shoot, I did the same thing again. File open. Extract transforms is part of the new bullet workflow that we've added. And I've got an example file in here for you guys to have a look at as well. And this one has some really nice example files in it um, that you can have a look at. And that's exactly what I did. I just downloaded the example files, uh, went to the help card and downloaded the example file. This one does have a nice example file whereby we have a torus that is being fractured and then is being animated. And if we scrub our playbook for you can see it's being animated. And what the extract pieces does is it's now finally a first class way of marrying the points that the, come out of the bullet solver and attaching it to our bullet objects. So here's our source geometry. And we can see we can time shift to the first frame as we always do to lock it down. And then we do a pack on this. So we're packing all the pieces together. And then we can use the extract transform in other words, this now is building the transform matrix for us. Now, I know there's a lot of tools you guys have written to support this in your own pipelines. But again, this one's using really solid code to basically build, um, if we take a look at the various attributes, again, let's, let's use our tools. So let's say show modification to attributes. We've added a name attribute, and we've added an orient attribute, and we've added a pivot attribute. So we can see very quickly, now without actually opening up the spreadsheet and doing the double take on the two inputs, we can see exactly what this, Operator is added. In other words, the full frame of reference, the full Fernet frame to describe each point is now there. So, and it's rock solid. And then we can use the transform pieces to now move those pieces by those points. And the whole idea here is to feed into bullet. So we can do an attribute create now, whereby we now have this active, you know, the active attribute. If you keyframe that, you can make objects go from inactive to active. And then we can pass it into a DOP network. So now it's trivial to get animated pieces released into DOPs. And of course, we could lease piece by piece by piece. Before, this was a, quite a complex setup. And that's why a lot, of, uh, a, lot of, a lot of the different facilities have written their own tools around this. Now we actually have, right out of the box, Extract Rigid Transform, another huge feature. And it's now accessible and we can use this to retime anything. So let's go back up. And new fall off SOP. Oh, oh, and I'm doing the same thing again. I should have like a... Except. Now the fall off SOP, this was, this was done quite some time ago and I think it even fell under the radar for a lot of our beta testers. But what we finally did is the fall off, the fall off SOP is brand new. And so here we can say, so now the fall off SOP allows me to, based on any primitive selection, give you a really nice fall off and you can control the radius. And yes, this can be keyframed. So we can now use this to do really cool wipes with smooths and stuff. So we can actually grow our fall offs this way. And the fall off has ramps where you can control explicitly how you want the fall off to happen. So pretty straightforward, really nice tool. And it actually creates a distance attribute and it creates a lead point attribute and it creates an inside uh, radius group as well. So it actually does some really nice stuff for us. And then of course we can scatter points and then we can transform the attribute and we can copy, we can do all kinds of fun stuff where we can now copy the attribute based, we can copy the tubes based on that attribute strength. So if we change the fall off, change those tubes. So there you go. Now, second way that we can do this is to show you some of the features of fall off. Um, basically the fall off SOP is actually the interactive tool that we had inside of the viewport for doing fall off. So <clears throat> we have three different ways in which to determine the fall off. The first one is uh, distant metric surface. In other words, just take the surface and do a transform. The second one is edge. So basically crawl along the edges and, and, and to do the distribution that way. Or the third one is to look at the radius. So we can do the radius as well. So now we can do a surface fall off. So you can see here now you have to crawl along the finger. So finally we can start bleeding attributes properly that way. And you can see here as we we grow across the various attributes and bleed across the surface. And the second one is edge. If we take this and we're basically uh, bleeding the, the attribute along the edges. So connected edges are now what's, is what's being the transport mechanism. And the third one is the old lovely radius fall off, which is pretty, pretty nice if you just want to do a broad sweeping 
rate of the display flag, just a broad sweeping radius. That's effective topology and so on. Let's go up. And graph color. Ooh so this is one of these really cool esoteric type SOPs that came out of the Vellum project. So I believe it was uh, one of the developers said, well, I need to have this tool. And it also came out of Jeff Late's, a um, couple of Jeff Late's master classes from, the, from a previous uh, master class on, on VEX. And so he wrote this SOP called Graph Color. And literally, Graph Color is all about how to color topological maps, in other words, graphical maps. And there was this theorem, that this, this uh, naive theorem that said, with four colors, with four identifying colors, you can, you can map the entire world. So here's my attempt at, at creating some, um, a map of a, of, a, of a continent, I guess you would imagine, and then applying the graph color to that. And what the graph color simply does is um, you just basically write it into an attribute. And if you take a look at the spreadsheet, I can see that it maps into four colors, yay. So it's, it's one way in which we can uh, um, figure out connectivity and connectivity as it associates with some random values. So if we had a surface <clears throat> and we wanted to figure out what was connected with just four, four different random values, like zero to, zero, to, zero to five, or in this case, we're doing five, um, it actually just allows you to find unique neighbors by, by recycling the same numbers. So that uh, if you take a look here, no two colors are touching, right? Which is a pretty cool tool if you think about it. Um, so it solves a very, very specific difficult problem whereby I wanna have a unique identifier for my primitive from all my neighbors. And there you go, so that's one way to do that. So it's a way of organizing uh, your geometry. So there you go. If you wanna read more, there's uh, I've got a little text file in the file that I'm gonna show you. And uh, um, so that's my example for that. So I literally took the interpretation of the paper. So <laughs> and it works. Um, although there's five, there's six colors in there, so I don't know if I'm limited to four. But anyway, new point velocity SOP. As we saw before, I'm not gonna cover that one, although there's a nice example file I got there for you. Shape difference, I need to give you an example file for that. And transform pieces, which is basically um, extract transform, by the way. So transform pieces, um, there's some really nice help cards in there. Actually, let's take a look at that. So I'm gonna put down a transform pieces in here. And go straight to the help card. I do this all the time. If you don't know about this, if there's a new SOP, I just put it down. I don't care if there's an error and go straight to the help. And hopefully there's some example files that ship with this because I really don't care about this. I just want the example files. That's why all SOPs should have example files in my opinion. So load, and then I press load, and I load these files and I load them all three into my current scene file. And now that I've done that, I can now go back up to the object level, lay that stuff out, and I can see here, um, there's my three examples. And I always turn the display flag off, and then I dive inside. And now I can see here all the different ways in which uh, transform, you know, transform pieces works. And as we saw, we already saw an example of that when we were doing the extract rigid transform. Transform pieces is a critical part of that. And you now you know what I do when I need to have a look. And this is a fractured SIM setup. So um, this is actually using DOPS, by the way, to show you how um, we're now using this to do the whole the low, right, low high res thing. In other words, there was a large request to just have DOPS simulate points, million, like hundreds of thousands of points with really simple instance geometry, but at any point in time, add more complex data to it. And that's what Transform Pieces does. It allows us now to completely decouple the collision geometry from the geometry that we wish to bind to the points easily. So it's no longer that tricky game of transform hell that we need to play. So and let's take a look at the third example. Uh, up again and down there. So always use your help cards if you have example files. So file open. And I wanted to use UV auto seam. Uh, let's take a look at the UV auto seam because it is really cool. Discard and open. Now, as you, as you know before from all the from all the exam, from all the, I guess from the sneak peek and the launch, we did cover a bit about all the UV tools. And UV flatten is is it's got a lot of rewriting done to it. But for me, the new one, which is really really powerful now, and liberates um, liberates us from just creating really cool um, 
really cool first shot uh, generating, generating UVs is the UV auto seam. As you can see, it tries to support mirroring as best it can. There's, it's a bit off on the ears, but it tries to support mirroring as best it can. And you have uh, existing islands, or you can actually use existing UV islands to partition the splits at, or you can do curvature based. And you have a whole bunch of nice tools to, to try and control where those, those, those pieces are, or where the, where the seams are generated. And uh, you can actually generate the island attributes as well if you want to use them further on down, if you're really interested in the actual island attribute as well. So it's an automatic way now that we can use to generate uh, UV seams. So Spacebar 5 shows us the UV layout. And of course, we've done lots of UV layout. Uh, pardon me, UV, UV layout would be a really cool tool. And it's actually saw a lot of work inside of Houdini 17 as well. And UV uh, island symmetry, island position in 3D, island symmetry, it tries to keep things symmetrical, scale islands to match their surface area. That question came up with a customer last week. You know, they're really, they're really, they do a lot of real world scans. They have scans of maybe tiles and carpet tiles and real world things, and they want the islands to match their surface area. So that gives you a really good shot at trying to preserve the, the, the UV scale. And lots of really cool options in the UV layout tool. Definitely check it out. And I'm going to go up to the winding number. Now this one is about as, as, as esoteric a note as you can get. So I tried to create, um, I grabbed a seam file from, from the past archives because this was added in uh, a long time ago. Oh, we've got a raised hand too. So here's an example file I gleaned. I did not do this myself. I, it might, I suspect it might have come from Neil from R&D, um, but whoever made this, kudos to them. <laughs> I could have actually looked at the user and the nodes. But um, in this case, what, one of the things that the winding number swap is really good at is doing testing. Am I inside or am I outside? Am I in a polygon face or am I outside a polygon face? Or am I somewhere in between? So that's what winding number really does for us. In this case, it's a good example of that being in, put into practice. So if I do a divide swap, and you can see here, I actually have indiscriminate, there, this file indiscriminately places three polygons on a single face. And you want to hold, you want to basically remove any of the overlapping geometry. So that's the task that we want to use the winding numbers for. So we can uh, facet that all up. We can triangulate 2D that. So we can, we can and you can see the whole SOP here. We have the holes detected. So the whole SOP can do that, but maybe we want to do it in a more programmatic way. So we can triangulate. And then we can attribute wrangle. Just add uh, geo self as p and remove from geo self prim. So we're just adding some attributes, and then we run it through the winding number test. So the right side is the is the point is the, the geometry, and the left hand side are the point clouds. So we want to do a test for every point. Um, how do we compare to the geometry? And what we're doing is we're actually again, if we go to the info, we can see what attributes are created, and we can see it added this new attribute called winding number. And if we take a look at the attribute wrangle, um, we now just simply writing into this attribute called bar, foo bar, right? If you ever see foo and bar, you know it's an inside joke, but then you're setting bar. And then we can blast based on bar. So in other words, we can detect whether or not those points are, um, are inside or outside our test case. And then we can blast that. And, or we can color it as well. So we can color the attribute state as well. Yeah, so that's, uh, and there's a couple, there's one other example in there that I'm shipping for you guys. So, and I think that's my quick pass at all the, at all the interesting SOPs anyway. So what time are we at now? Two o'clock. Oh gosh, I just to take some quick questions and I'm, how far am I along? I'm at six. Six, six out of <laughs> 10. And yeah, maybe we'll skip questions for now. No, no, we can do some quick questions. So. Uh, Luke said, you mentioned something about anisotropic kernel. Oh yeah, the Vorno. I'll get to that in the next loom okay. next week. We'll do another one next week because um, I want to really focus in on the on the destruction pipeline next. Sounds week. good. Um, I'm, he said, I'm assuming that the retime requires a recache of geometry for rendering. Um, let me think about recache of the geometry for rendering. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. If you're so the the question, there is no procedural right now that does retiming inside of Mantra. So you would definitely have to. Uh, retime somehow before rendering. So yeah, you you'd be retiming caches to disk and then rendering those caches. Yes. So there's no procedure. Actually, that's a good idea though. But yeah, the mantra. Doesn't, actually, it's not because mantra doesn't know how to do that yet. 
uh, is the time warp node now just for backwards compatibility, meaning does ReTime have the same features and more? Yes, yeah, yeah. It's, it's gone. Do not use it. Deprecated, will the volume be exported with ReTime? Yes, you can write, you can just put a file cache after ReTime and then recache re your volumes. Love these fast answers. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. Uh, can we change? Uh, no, no, no. Can we have those new options from Node fall off inside attribute transfer? Well, say that again. Can we have those new options from Node fall off inside the attribute transfer? Um, we could add it to attribute transfer, yes, but it's not in there right now. Okay. Um, attribute transfer in itself needs a needs a refactoring. And I believe it's pretty high on the list. So we'll, fingers crossed, it'll get some love in the next release. Can VEX now operate 64 bit? Ah, yes. Easy answer. <laughs> that was a tough one because yeah. I've been waiting that for years. Um. <laughs> We're getting pulled. Yes, uh, next question. That's, that's it for now. Okay, no. so the 64 bit VEX, we. Oh, a couple of quick ones. Uh, yeah, yeah. Promote retime as a parameter to HDA? Yes, absolutely. Uh, can you say a couple of words about hair? I have some flickering when generating hairs. Oh, that's, um, you know what? I am going to go to the forums. Put that one on the forum. Yeah, put that on the forum. But I'm going to be there tonight. Gene. Finally. Uh, I'm not doing as much traveling anymore, so I have no more excuses. Can yes. you summarize gotchas when doing 16.5 pyro tutorials in 17? Do they break? That is a great, um, that's a great idea. Yeah, we could do that one. So basically 16.5 to 17 pyro gotchas. Because I ran through them several, several like a few months ago. Yeah. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I was teaching uh, VDB sourcing. So I'd, I'd like to do it the other way around. Um, maybe we take 16.5, add VDB sourcing to that, and then see why we did the things inside of VDB 17. So take 16.5, modernize it for those yeah. that are still stuck using 16.5, mm -hmm. and then show you exactly what we did in 17. We should do a whole new pyro. Yeah, yeah, we can do that, yeah. That's a great idea, by the way. Um, cool, I think we'll keep going then. We still have lots to go. Yeah, okay, so soon, next week, maybe we do two. Oh, you wanna stop now? I thought we were gonna keep going. Oh, wait, let's keep on going, let's sure. Keep going, man. Yeah, okay. Let's do it. Okay. We got time. More, more yeah, I've got time, more yeah. questions, sure. Yeah, let's go. Yeah. Number seven. Number seven. Oh, you wanna keep going? Yeah. Okay, so there's nothing holding us back. We can do it. But this is going to be mammoth. Everybody complains that they're so long. Oh, people! That's two hours. <laughs> Let's keep going. No. Okay, if you want to. So uh, the next one, actually, let's let's rip them really fast because this is supposed to be just an overview of all the features, and then ask you guys what you want to dig into. So the terrain features, as I said before, just see what Ari's done. He's got some really fantastic master classes on terrains, and the the. His approach to doing the terrains is fantastic because he looks at, at it from a process point of view. So, you know, different stages, different steps you do to work up to building your full terrain. So definitely follow his two master classes. The detangle SOP is awesome. I know a lot of you guys are playing with it, but for me, detangle is a great way of taking a look at exactly what's happening inside of uh, the vellum solver. Because as I said, the vellum solver itself for me now is a cheap and cheerful way of just deforming geometry. And as we saw, it's extraordinarily powerful at doing that as well. So I have a really nice example file here that uses Detangle. And Detangle is an, yet another SOP that was extracted out of the vellum project that uh, was turned into a first class operator. And as we know, there's a lot of examples for Detangle, but I think for, for novice users, it can be one of those SOPs that really tests your patience. So maybe we're gonna step through this one a bit. And, and because if we can understand detangle, we have a good shot at understanding what vellum is doing uh, behind the scenes. So in this case, I have a line, and an attribute wrangle on it, an attribute, and I got this p-scale. It needs p-scale, first of all. So there's a few different things that um, this uh, detangle SOP needs. What it really needs is a previous position. And the way I think of detangle is an actual type of a node that does a solver. And that we need to have a rest position for this line somewhere such that all the lines are not intersecting any of the other lines or any of the colliders. So we need to make sure the pieces, when they're first 
brought in as this old position, they're all in a position whereby they're not touching anything. And I think, I don't know where I put this, let me hide other objects here. And let me display that. So there's my grid collider, but uh, the detangle. So if we take a look here. Oh, I'm de detangling all the lines. Maybe I went a bit too fast, but so here, I'm gonna go back to the switch and I'm gonna go, I have a switch node in this file. I'm gonna go back to the first single line and let's make one line work. It's the typical Houdini scenario. Get one thing to work, then crank the numbers up and then go crazy, right? But, but understand the fundamental of how a node works because it in itself is a feature, application, plugin, whatever you wanna call it. So I created an attribute wrangle, which is a P scale. And then I have a bit of a network as we saw here that just simply gives me one line, a lot of lines or even more lines with some randomness to it. Um, so what I need now to do is I need to transform it away. So we need to have a rest position or an old position whereby none of the lines are intersecting. So I just wanna get it out of the way. And you can think of this as a run up to where the final position is, where we want the detangle to solve. Um, and if the problem is if you have lines that are intersecting, it can create some problems with detangle. But in this case, just get it the heck out of the way. And then I added another attribute expression called old P. And simply, or pardon me, attribute expression, creating a new attribute. Remember, I got that really neat info here. We say show modifications to attributes. I wish that was all by default, by the way. Is there a way to do that? No. So we can see that we've just added old P here. So very clearly we can see that this added old P and we set it to the position that we transferred here. And then we do an attribute copy and we, add, we copy old P onto the, uh, to the original geometry. We're sort of in effect building our own solver, if you think about it. So we need our arrest position and we need the position where we want it to run up to, to do the solve. And that's exactly what this is happening here. And then we add a p-scale attribute because as I said before, detangle really needs the p-scale attribute. And we set it to 0 0.005, which is basically the wire width thickness, if you think about it. And here I've done uh, just some random fitting and I can switch between the two. I did this because I have, I have a case, case we're gonna do hundreds of wires and I just switch out to the, to the first input here. Or I can actually fish it the second, doesn't matter. And then I can run the detangle. And you can see here I'm adding a collider, which is just a grid as well. So we can add collision geometry and then we can add wires. So this works on wires. It works on points. It just works on points. And, and it tries to use edges to, um, if you have uh, resolve all free edges, it'll then and take into consideration edges as well. Because remember the new Vellum solver is a point-based solver. It's a position-based dynamic solver or extended position-based dynamic solver. That's what the X stands for and the PVD stands for. It's just a point solver and a very elegant, very fast, a very fast one, but in the end of the day, it's just moving points, particles. So that means anything that goes with particles is fair game. And of course, I just got a simple sweep here. We do have um, a vellum visualize node that I will use. Okay, vellum, oh, vellum post-process, I'm sorry. Vellum post-process that is really handy at working in some different cases. Um, so sometimes if you have enough attributes, you can actually have, um, you can actually visualize these wires as well, show collision guide geometry. If it's there, we can actually put the collision guide geometry in there and we can show collision geometry if you want to. Well, it has to be properly factored and I need to do vellum configure. But anyway, um, you can actually do this with the vellum post process as well, sort of see some of the thickness on the geometry as well. And you can see the, the varying thickness as well. So Vellum Post Process is one, of these is one of these tools you can use in a generalized way. So, so far I've seen Vellum files are using Vellum as you're supposed to use them. I like breaking things and seeing how far you can push it. And you can really bust Vellum apart and use many different pieces to do some really, really clever things in your scene file. So look for really more interesting things to come as uh, you know, we wake up the next morning and you see what you can do with it. In this case, we have the sweep. As we can see, the randomness is being set by this randomized scale. If I go to zero, you can see you get a uniform randomized. So now that's what we need to do. And we can break this, by the way, we can bypass the transform. And if we bypass the transform, we can see that the detangle fails. So in other words, the detangle cannot, it must, must have a starting position. So now we can play with this transform to see how close we can get it before it starts to fail. So we're basically using, and you can see here, it's our collision planes the problem. So if I template my collision plane here, 
And if I press this, this, uh, this transform here, um, you can see as we move the transform up, let me template, let me shift click the trampoline on this guy as well. So as we move it up, you can see here, obviously as our line crosses our collider, you can see it doesn't work. So if we wanted to use this tool, for instance, to lay feathers on a skin or to, um, or to do other sorts of initial setups, we need to be careful where we put that recipe. And that's the only thing you need to, or one of the key things you need to worry about detangle. And that's what this file is all about, is how far you can move that transform, understanding that uh, you, know, you can do all of that. So once we know that, now we can add a whole crap load of particles. So this network here is just a way of just generating a whole bunch of lines in a way that they don't interpenetrate. And here you go, so there's my, my second set of lines. And you can see how frightfully fast detangle is. It is really fast. So, and you're almost guaranteed that none of these lines are going to detangle given enough, uh, um, enough um, uh, resolve all max passes. So the way max passes works is a stacking issue. So if we had, for instance, 10 lines stacked on top of each other, we might want to resolve 10 interpenetrations of gravity going down. So in this case, 10 is more than sufficient. As a matter of fact, we can probably get this down to much lower values if we wanted to. And resolve all free edges. That's to basically resolve any edges that are uh, completely free in the air. I saw a little bit of a flicker in there, so let's see what that does. In other words, it takes into account the edges as well, so the edges don't cross over within a tolerance. Layer attribute, layer shock. Layer shock is, um, so if we, again, no, that, pardon me, I'm, I had it incorrect. If you have, let's say, a whole bunch of wires stacked on top of each other, it's how many wires do we think we might have stacked tightly together? And that layer shock sort of now says I can have 10 wires closely packed together versus four wires closely packed, and it will resolve properly. So if you have a bundle of wires that you're working on, and you, have, you can have maybe 20 wires, you might have to set that to 20 in order to finally resolve all of the uh, edge, inter, uh, edge um, uh, edge collisions or edge intersections, self friction, static thresholds. So you can see there's a lot of attributes shared here with the actual solver itself, but that's detangle. And then of course, I've seen some really creative uses of it using for space filling up curves and using detangling or multiple detangles and file loops. But this essentially is what's giving you that. And of course I had to sweep my tubes and uh, tubes is using P scale, so you can get some pretty crazy stuff. But as I said before, you can really push this thing. And I got another test case here that uses quite a lot of uh, curves here. I don't know how many, 30,000 points, 3,000 polygons. So, And now you can see how this can scale up for doing detangling of hair prior to doing a final pass. But you definitely want to stand the hair on end first and then settle them down into the final position to resolve your interpenetrations. Here's another example where I basically just use a for each loop to do the old intestine type thing, right? So. So you're just doing a for each loop through the point jitter. Some two typical cases of using uh, the tangle. So let's keep on going along. So let's go to files. New objects, something we covered. Game dev tools. I think that with the game dev tools, uh, check them out. There's uh, been a lot of really yeah, nice we'll work. Webinar on them next one. Yes, so next that's one leading into... So that's leading to that webinar. Check it out. I mean, Game, game Dev Tool for me are a huge tool. And uh, we just had a, a meeting or, or sort of a, a summit in, in the UK or EU. And we brought in a whole bunch of uh, customers and, and we had games and film side. And one of the things that came out of it was that the games tools are actually do have a lot of use inside of film. And a lot of our data does, does indicate that uh, these tools are being used by pretty much everybody that's doing meaningful work. So the game dev tools saw a really nice update in Houdini 17. So the team's going to cover that. So and next Wednesday, uh, it's going to be Paul, Luis, and, uh, and Mike Linden uh, are going to be doing a webinar next Wednesday. And then we should do something um, maybe in a few weeks talking about how the game tools can be used in production on film and TV. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, because uh, the use cases are great. And my top 11. <laughs> so this one is. I've seen some really cool uses of the pop fluid dot. And if you're using pops, a lot of, um, a lot of times you want to build volume into your particle system. So generally how you would do that is, I'm, gonna, I'm just basically going to shake these off right now. Actually put that merge in there and shake this off here. 
well, this is just a simple particle system that I built. And, and I got some nice readme files in here of a, of a couple of really nice examples and one user case of, of using pop fluid. But in this case, we have a simple particle simulation. I'll just turn my points on for now so you can see them. And it's just particle systems. Generally, we'd use the pop interact. So let's try and use pop interact. And pop interact is uh, it's an, it's an old school node that tries to use repulsive forces uh, to simulate ballistic type simulations without relying on ballistics. So it's really naive approach to do uh, position force and a core radius. So here you can sort of set the core radius maybe to the P scale and the fall off radius maybe to the same. But what this is using, it's using, it's a naive approach of trying to keep the particles from interpenetrating, keeps them spaced out. And you can see here if I, if I increase the core radius, they'll puff out a bit more. And you can get them really to explode if you, and you can increase the force as to which they'll try and stay apart. So this is a, um, a very naive way of trying to keep the particles from interpenetrating. And it's slow. I mean, if you start adding up a lot of particles, this guy is going to get really, really slow. So we're going to bypass it. Now, we added, as part of the white water solver, which, by the way, is really cool, um, and I'm, I'm expecting there's going to be some sort of master class on that pretty soon. Um, one of the offshoots of that is this really incredible pop fluid dot. And it now completely takes over pop interact. The only thing you need to worry about is you really should wire this last in line. Now, generally, I will line all my pop type effectors in a line, and I never use this merge. Now, I will make sure that I use the merge, but make sure the pop fluid is the last one in. And now take a look what happens. Now we're getting a much more sophisticated way of, of working with these particles. And it's very similar to SPH. And a lot of us are big fans of SPH. We saw what SPH is capable of doing from doing snow simulations to doing some really type, nice type ballistic type simulations. And so what we extracted out of the whitewater solve is pop fluid. And now we have a cheap and cheerful way of keeping interaction. We can do stacking and fluid buildup. And so really, really cheap and cheerful type fluid tools are now available to us. And if we want, we can go to the pop fluid. Um, lots of different uh, options in here. We have update positions. I was doing update velocities because like we can do with SPH, uh, we can actually control um, this is cool about uh, one, of the, one of the properties of SPH that this does share is we can do the velocity blend. As we know, there's PIC versus APIC and there's uh, all kinds of different options that you have in FLIP and SPH. But if I do the velocity blend to zero, guess what? It has absolutely no effect. When I have projection type set to update velocities. But check what happens when I turn the velocity blend almost to the, almost to the, the ballistic type motion. Now I get what looks like an SPH type solve. So, this is cool. So the documentation says don't use update velocities. And I'm going, oh, <laughs> right? Once you understand what the tool is, if the documentation tells you to do one thing, try doing something else with it. I mean, you know. But anyway, the whole deal about using update velocities is the velocity blend. It's the only one that supports this particular attribute. And you can see here now, you can create the most nicest evenly spaced set of particles that you want. And you can knock that back down. Obviously, the default is update positions, which makes the most sense. So update positions actually also updates the velocity, and you can actually use the velocity blend as well. So you can blend as much as previous velocity and current velocity that you want into the current positions. So SPH for sure. And now you can sort of do uh, cheap and cheerful water type simulations. So this is the next step beyond SPH. And I know a lot of you have, have been wanting to, to revisit SPH. I'd say use pop fluid. It's, it's a nice quick uh, tool for doing any sort of liquidy type particle stuff. And of course, the final one is update forces. And this one shares more with pop interact than, than any of the other options in that it tries to use forces to keep the particles apart. So if you do want to have a pop interact type workflow, go for it. This gives you a more spongy feel between the particles where they, they, they're, they're not so much ballistic, they're more spongy. And this one gives you some really nice effects as well. So. Um, this is all or nothing, so if you want to have transient states, you know, um, you, can, you can sort of do that with attributes. And all the attributes that are supported by the new Whitewater are also supported by the pop fluid, because I don't think we even mentioned that in the documentation. I don't know. I'll just check the docs now to see if we mention any attribute inheritance in here. 
but uh, yeah, pop fluid is, is, is a fun, fun, fun tool. And by the way, it works on anything that's point based. So, um, take a look here. Da, da. Detect, update position velocities, forces, tensile strength. No, I'm going to have to do a full list of attributes that this can, can be used to override stuff. Um, but as I said before, it can, be, it can be used on anything. The only criteria that is required is if we go take a look at the spreadsheet and the object that we wish to apply it to has to have just one thing on it, geometry points. So if we take a look, for instance, it's the pop object. Obviously, pop object has geometry. What else has geometry? Bullet. What else has geometry? Flip. What else has point geometry available to us? Uh, particles, as we're seeing here. So anything that has a point, you know, you can, you can apply pop fluid. So it even works with bullet. And yes, it works with vellum. Most importantly of all, you can use pop fluid on vellum solves. So for instance, if you had a cloth solver, you could use pop fluid. And I think that's what I'm gonna end off with. So um, definitely pop fluid, interact, pop interact, gone. Pop fluid there. If you want pop interact, go to update forces, everything else, use update positions. And if you wanna play around with SPH, sort of chewy sort of type simulations, go to velocities and, and, and use it that way. Now, finally, I'm gonna do file new and uh, and this one will be it because this is what everything I did want to cover. So let's put down a grid. And in the grid, um, there's lots of stuff that's being done on vellum. So what I'm going to do here is um, go to here. And just to be, I'm just going to put down a vellum configure. Let's do it, uh, vellum configure cloth. And let's put a vellum, uh, vellum, solver and I just want to do some solves and and show how far we can get with that and go with that might as well wire all three up even though they're not valid on the grid and let's make this <laughs> the funny thing is we're finding that everybody's solving 50 by 50 grids and um, and I want to basically just run the play bar. Nothing's really going to happen to this piece of cloth because there's no, it'll drop down. So let's remove the, the gravity. So here I'm going to remove uh, gravity. So what's in the vellum solver, by the way. So this to me reminds me of the old spring soft, but it's way beyond what the old spring soft had because it gives us everything we went. There's it's just like what the old spring soft had. Gravity, wind, and wind drag. So uh, let's remove the gravity. We want to add some wind because we want to blow this cloth in the wind. So let's let's add some wind in the in the in the positive z direction. Let's say of one unit or two units. Press forward. And the problem is we have it's based on tangent drag. So um, the number one motivator for vellum is going to be tangent versus normal drag. So we might want to let's let's do a simple rotate on the grid, which we can do now. Yay! In the x-axis. Couldn't do this before. So let's actually rotate a bit, just so the wind will grab it a bit and blow our cloth about a bit quicker. And uh, and you'll notice that there's not too much noise being added to our to our grid objects. So um, so what we need to do is dive inside the vellum solver, and uh, we can add some forces in here. Um, but what I want to do here is uh, a loading of contents and dive inside because there's a dive target, right? And uh, maybe I didn't want to do that, but probably what I want to do is go straight into a vellum solver. So let's put down a top network. Ah, eh, you know what? I'm going to leave it for another day, but uh, um, we could actually, let's actually go inside of here. Is this dops? So let's pop. Yeah, put a pop fluid down in here. And what we can do is we can inherit that in. We can put that into there. And now we can wire some pop fluid in here. We can also put in some uh, uh, pop wind we want to add our own wind. Remember pop fluid always comes last. We can add some pop wind in here as well. We can add some amplitude with some noise. Let's actually go into this direction. So um, you can do pretty much whatever you want in here in the pop fluid. Let's actually add some fluid water type movement to our cloth. So now it behaves very fluidly. And you get all the self collisions that you get with vellum. So there's a tremendous amount of stuff you can do in vellum. Uh, beyond all of those really simple, um, look what you can do with it just simply. Now we can dive in here, we can do all kinds of really cool stuff to, remember what I said, the only condition is that does my simulation object have points? And here we go, we open up the spreadsheet 
go to the vellum object. There's my geometry, or this is my constraint term. There's my geometry, and guess what? There's points. Checklist, I can now use pop fluid. So any solver that has points and geometry in the geometry, you can use pop fluid. Or you can even add this to the binding itself. You can actually add it to any geometry. Actually, I'd like to this constraint geometry if you want to be crazy. Yeah. You can add to constraint geometry, but the constraints aren't being used. But anyway, so you can add this to whatever you want. So I'm going to control minimize with that. So there's a lot of stuff we can cover instead of DOPS and sort of the games you can play. But yeah, pop fluid working in cloth, piece of cake. And now it adds these really nice fluid type uh, behaviors to it. And uh, so pop fluid, we can increase the particle separation, um, the tensile radius, lower that down a bit, tensile strength, increase that a bit. Things will get a little bit more and add some viscosity to that and add some vorticity confinement. So we get some nice twirliness. And there you go. One final question, then we'll call it a bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, what about transferring your low res box into your render asset? Cloth capture node seems to have real issues with weight editing. Well, it's all covered in the, in the Vellum post process. So that's something that, that we can look at. Uh, there is a way forward to do that much more accurately now. But there, yeah, so we can cover that. Or if the master class doesn't cover it, we will. Um, but sure, yeah, so there you go. Pop fluid, awesome. So you can create some camera. Oh, 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 sorry about that. So I, so I think that, that pretty much wraps it up for now. Jeez, it's long. Um, and it's perfect time. You, so, you, got, you got all of your 10 in so I'm, with a bonus 11, right? With a bonus 11, which is the pop fluid, which is just scary what you can do with it. Pop fluid, you think it works on that. It's basically just a, a, a it's, an, it's, it's equivalent. It's very similar to SPH. So you get these really nice ballistic type simulations and you can do really cool stuff on it. As you can see here, all this motivation is coming from pop fluid working with the wind. And let me turn real time on. So long, long webinar. I think it was worth, I think 17 is worth it. And to be honest, we're not even scratching the surface on 17. I mean, as we use it over the next month or month, the next two months, we're going to discover even more features that we snuck in here. I remember I said it was almost two years in development and with a 16.5 just to put stuff in that, that, that got around backwards compatibility. So I'll be on the forums tonight, tomorrow morning, and mop this thing up and get going for the next one next week. Maybe we do two next week. So because uh, there's an awful lot to cover and an awful hurry. I know there's a lot of inf interest in 17, so we'll try and capture a lot of the more esoteric features. So. Like you said, we'll be doing games tools on Wednesday with the yep. games team. Next uh, week. Wednesday at noon EST. Um, so tune into that. And even if you're not on the game side, because again, those games tools are relevant to uh, your film and TV and advertising, motion graphics, et cetera. So yeah. Thanks, guys. You bet. Bye.